We are live tonight, guys. This is Standing for Truth, and we got a really, really fun program for you tonight. We've got another knockout punch to evolutionism. This is the G Man versus Erica edition. So we're going to have some fun. We got some uh, objections and arguments that we are going to demolish. So we've got some very well informed creationists here with us. Uh, tonight, I'm sure none of them need any introduction. We've got uh, Praise I Am That I Am. We've got Ramat, Nephilim Free, and Jason. So I'm going to toss it over to them for a minute just to uh, kind of introduce themselves or, uh, yeah, give us the uh, rundown. What's going on, guys? Good to be here. Thanks for having us. You know, uh, we always enjoy putting, putting evolution in its place where it deserves, right in the garbage can. By the way, just wanted to announce, I've been performing abiogenesis experiments all my life, and I have yet to see anything crawl out of my kitchen track. Still nothing, eh? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's why we get up in the morning to refute this nonsense. We should take all their so-called evidence out of the textbook and put it in the trash where it belongs, just like you said, Neff. Indeed. So let's, um, let's get right into it, if that's what you want to do. We've got uh, quite a few arguments here that we want to demolish one by one. What we did was we made it easy. Uh, we put together a couple, um, uh, I guess, a, a couple clips from last night's debate. Uh, for all those that have seen it, it was the uh, G-Man versus Erica do you debate think on Modern Day Debate. So we're going to play those. We're going to give our thoughts. Uh, we'll jump into her opening statement. Uh, of course, we've had some debates and discussions in the past. Raw Matt just had one recently with her. I definitely uh, recommend watching those ones uh, because there is definitely some thorough refutations in, in those videos. So, uh, like I said, if, if you want to uh, praise, you want to um, kind of get us going or what? Yeah, and John Maddox just came in. Brother John, how you doing? Can you hear us, John? He's muted, probably. John, are you still muted, brother? Well, he might be having some issues. That's fine. So, praise. Um, how do you want to get this started? Did you want to get the video going, or? Yeah, I'm just going to load your uh, picture in real quick. No problem. Take your time. What did you guys think about uh, last night's uh, discussion? We can go around the room. Well, Matt, we'll start with you. What do you think, brother? Oh man, about the uh, the debate in general, or the overall the uh, the overall uh, yeah your overall thoughts about it. Oh, man. Well, uh, G-Man, his opening, I, I don't even know what to say to that. Uh, I mean, really, ho horses can walk after they're born. This is proof of intelligent design. I mean, he should have been a lot more ready for Erica than that. She, she studies to train, you know, to take these, these debates as far as she can. And uh, G-Man was not prepared for <laughs> for what was happening. Matter of fact, I, I don't even know how she coursed him into coming on the Dapper Dino show afterwards. Because there's not only her, but like five other people as well to contend with. And they're going to be asking him questions far more advanced than she was in that debate. And he didn't really have any answers. Did he answer any of her opening, by the way? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Um, and, and that's the thing, right? We want... Um, our fellow Christian creationists, of course, to, to know that there's, I mean, to be honest with you, we've answered all of her arguments, um, all of these same typical evolutionist arguments numerous times. So there are arguments and refutations out there. Um, most people in, in our audience have probably seen us debunk them anyways. Um, but uh, jumping into their discussion, I, I don't, I don't think so. But uh, you've touched on something important there, Rama. Yeah, like I've noticed that evolutionists don't even know um, our model. You know, they don't even know about top creationist arguments. Um, and you're right; they are going to be asking the tough questions. And unfortunately, if 
if you're a creationist and you're not up to date on uh, the creationist literature, you, unfortunately, you might not have an answer to some of those tough questions. Yeah, well, I mean, that's why we exist. We make videos and upload videos probably every day. Almost every day I'm releasing a video. So there's yeah. content for pretty much everything that exists now. You know what's so obvious to me about these uh, outspoken evolutionists is that uh, many of them, however, have heard the uh, creationist response to uh, their claims, and they just dismiss it and go right on making the claim, keep on doing it. It, it demonstrates that they're not actually interested in what science actually shows. They're interested only in defending their worldview. Because the evidence is so profound for intelligent design or creation or the flood of Noah, whatever, that uh, it's absolutely irrefutable. And they'll laugh at you when you say that, but it truly is. And so, because it's so clear and so strong, uh, the fact that they just dismiss it and go right on repeating the same claims over and over proves they're not being with, with themselves, they're not being intellectually honest with the evidence. They just dismiss it because it contradicts their worldview, and that can't be true because I just don't want to believe in God, you know. Actually, that's a phenomenal point, yeah. You'll notice that these evolutionists, if let's say they're debating one of us, for example, and if you've experienced it over and over again, I know I have, we'll refute their arguments live for everybody to see, but then when they go up against somebody else who maybe they think is not going to have a refutation of that, they'll still recycle that same already refuted argument. And, yep. and a couple that came to mind was, even in this debate, you'll see uh, when we get to that section, but um, arguments like, uh, you know, the nested hierarchies that we see in the biological wor world, or even endogenous retroviruses. I know Erica spent uh, some time on that in her opening. And, you know, we're all thinking we've refuted those arguments over and over and over again. Um, and, and their so-called best arguments that, that they've used over the years anyways, they've all been completely overturned. Um, is it, at this point, they really have nothing else to offer, as I think the audience is going to see here tonight. We're all ready to go, so um, I'm going to put the uh, go ahead and share it now. Here we go. Do you think that cats and tigers share a common ancestor in, in the form of some kind of basal created kind cat? Do I believe that a cat and a, and a, and a tiger have a common ancestor? Uh, I believe that they're related. Okay. I'm going to see it that way. I believe, I believe that they're related. So then there's something of a snafu because common house cats and Bengal tigers share, when you compare their, their genome side by side, they share about 95.5% of their DNA as as being similar, right? Okay. But humans and chimpanzees share, depending on who you're talking to and whether you're looking at coding base pairs or not, 95 to 99%. So why, from an empirical sense, right? Because what we're, what, at least with Kent, you know, I had a very similar conversation, which is that, you know, he wants to say that mm -hmm. there, there's a scientific basis. Right. If you want to tell me that you're not an animal and you're not an ape, and the reason is because you accept the very literal version of, gen of Genesis and of the Bible, that's cool. The problem comes when you say that it's scientific because by the same criteria that you're using to place house cats and tigers as, as related to each other, they classify moreover for not just humans and chimps, but gorillas, orangutans, um, and, and all of the kittens. So do, do you see what I'm saying? Um, so do you guys want to respond? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump on that one real quick. Um, I've answered that one so many times, so it's kind of like at the top of my head. It'll take me a couple minutes just to cover it because this is a common objection. Um, is, my, is my audio coming in okay? I heard an, uh, an echo there for a second. Yeah, you're okay. fine. Okay. And then I know, um, I know Raw Matt answered that a bunch of times too, so uh, you, know, he can give the, you guys can give your input after. I'll, I'll touch it real quick. Uh, technically, for the audience, uh, the question that Erica is is asking G-Man is, is simply this, and, and you can find this in like the BioLogos uh, literature, for example. You know they think it's it's a major problem for us in the creationist uh, field, but uh, you know she's pretty much implying that groups of species, uh, you know, even we would consider the same kind. For example, what did she say there? She said house cats, tigers, 
uh, Jaguars and Lions, for example, she's saying that even they have a far greater diversity within themselves than that of even humans and chimpanzees. So in other words, if, if the question is, if we can see diversity in related groups that exceeds the human and chimpanzee difference, why can we empirically and scientifically say house cats and tigers are related? Right, because we would say that they're part of the same created kind, but but not human humans and chimpanzees. Even though humans and chimpanzees are closer um, genetically than house cats and tigers, so uh, it, it comes down it, it comes down to this. It, it comes down to DNA differences, and it comes down to how how can we determine ancestry? Okay, so for humans and chimpanzees, if we look at the single letter differences. Um, let's say in the actual region that, that we can actually align. Um, let's say for sake of argument, we can just ignore those parts that don't align, right? For sake of simplicity. I mean, we know that they ignore things like copy number variations. Uh, I, I can hear some feedback if uh, I'm not sure who it's coming from. They want to mute it if they want to make sure they're muted. But um, even for sake of argument, let's just say that they're one or 2% difference between humans and chimps is accurate. Uh, that would mean there's maybe between 26 million and 30 million uh, DNA differences that's, that separate the two. But if you look at tigers and house cats, which we would say are related, we compare those animals at the single letter differences, you're actually looking at something like 50 million DNA differences. Right? Uh, but what the, are you guys he hearing some feedback at all? I was. Okay. I'm not too sure where that's, that's coming from. But I would say as a general rule, and I think everybody here is going to agree, um, it comes down to the testable hypotheses that, that we can make on kinds. So I think we would all agree that the kind level is right around the family level, right? But what does this imply about ancestry? Well, Erica here, for one, assumes that DNA level hierarchies and, and, and the DNA differences actually imply imply ancestry in all cases. But the question is, do the number of DNA differences or the patterns of DNA differences work as perfect tools or observations in determining relationship, right? So as everybody knows, we believe in what's called the created heterozygosity hypothesis. A lot of people will say, you know, well, what do you mean by that? That just simply means that God created Adam and Eve, and of course, the original kinds with pre-existing genetic diversity. The evolution is going to say, oh, that's that's post hoc, but it's not because uh, testable predictions actually flow from that hypothesis, which we can touch on later. But uh, okay. I, I, ask the audience how well they can hear you. I hear people saying too much feedback. So if you need to repeat something, ask now. I'm hearing a lot of feedback too. That's why I was asking. Is, is yeah, anybody yeah, asking? Yeah, yeah. If you have speakers going and you're using a headset at the same time, that might be the cause. No, I, I took my. Uh, no, I, I don't. Is, is everyone else on mute and it's just me talking? Correct. Hmm. Yeah, I'm mute and it's dead quiet where I am anyway. If I wasn't muted, it's just absolutely dead quiet here. So, And I'll mute again right now. Let's see. If there's some more feedback, maybe I'll jump out and come back in and refresh it. Let me know if you guys hear feedback again. Um, but it sounds like everyone's mu muted now. So, um, yeah, we will... You know, we would just say that Adam and Eve, for example, they would have had DNA differences within themselves. And of course, this idea would apply universally among species. So, for example, each created kind was front loaded with functional DNA differences that through a variety of processes and mechanisms, right, that have led to the origin of species. So, I mean, recombination, gene conversion, genetic drift, isolation, inbreeding, migration, all of those things uh, would lead to the origin of species. But all of this. All of this to say that, uh, to answer Erica's question, you know, all the evidence indicates that God created animals with a greater ability to diversify. So in other words, the original animal kinds were front loaded with more diversity than humans. And this actually makes sense since we know, according to scripture, God created populations of animal kinds. And then what? Only two humans, Adam and Eve. This is why we know the human race has low genetic diversity, which would suggest that we came from a small population. But what's, what's fascinating is that if, if you combine the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome data, 
It wasn't just a small population. It was a population of just two, as the Bible would tell us, Adam and Eve. So we can see that the answer to her question is that God gave animals a greater ability to diversify. And she's thinking DNA level hierarchies and just DNA differences between species alone we determine ancestry when we actually know that that's not the case. And then that's not what we would assume either. So uh, what are your thoughts on that, guys? Well, the way the evolutionists compare genomes is very, uh, pun intended, specious. They, they, uh, there are tremendous differences have been discovered in the genomes of humans and chimpanzees. And uh, evolutionists are, are slow to catch up or don't like talking about them. Uh, for example, uh, within the autosomes of our genomes, uh, it's 66 to 76 percent similarity. In the X chromosome, 69 percent. Y chromosome, only 43 uh, percent. So they're, they're leaving out, the, the way that they check for similarity is very specious and they don't use the whole genome either. Uh, one of the most damaging reports on this matter was by Hughes, uh, J.F. Hughes et al., uh, published in 2007. Uh, we're on in page 538. He talks about this uh, fact that it's very it's very disingenuous the way that they they compare genomes. In fact, there are actually tremendous differences in the genomes of human beings and chimpanzees. Let me give you just a couple of things that that are astonishing. For example. In the uh, in chrom in the gene uh, in chromosome number one, human beings have thirty nine hundred fifty eight genes known. Chimpanzees have twenty nine hundred seventy seven. That's a thirty two point ninety five percent difference. And in chromosome two, an eighty three point uh, percent difference. Uh, chromosome number three, twenty nine point seventy four percent difference. Chromosome number four, thirty six point zero five percent difference. In the number of genes in these chromosomes and it goes on and on and on all the way through the human genome and, and so that's a tremendous number of difference in, in genes comparing the number of base pairs for only a segment of the entire genome of an, of an animal is not going to give you a clear picture of genetic similarity. Just the fact that we have so many different numbers of genes in each chromosome compared to the chimpanzee should raise anybody's hair on their head if they were an evolutionist. Well, Neb, something else to add to that point you're making is uh, things like uh, microRNAs, uh, which have incredible uh, outcomes in terms of variation on gene expression, just as you know, you know, a foundational component. The humans and apes have a fairly dramatic difference in the number of known microRNAs, which they're continuing to discover more and more. And in that context, we're only talking about something that's, you know, anywhere from 20 to 60 to 70 base pairs and is being able to alter the outcome of literally hundreds of different genes. So to me, when you really think about that, if only 20 or 30, you know, 20 to 70 uh, base pairs are being able to alter those outcomes to such an extent, the requirement of gene differences to uh, percentage-wise to have incredibly different outcomes takes them on, on an entirely different context in my opinion. It, it does and, and another thing uh, that needs to be kept in mind is these uh, genetic similarities are typically centered upon the similarity in protein codes and of course we should find extraordinary similarity between them if a chimpanzee needs an enzyme that's able to break down potassium and human beings do as well because we share a similar environment and have similar things in our diet then there's going to be a tremendous number of sim uh, similarity there between the uh, enzyme and a uh, the number and arrangement of amino acids in an enzyme in a chimpanzee designed to break down potassium and in a human being they're going to be tremendously similar this ignores the whole rest of the genome. I mean, if you concentrate just on protein codes, but you're going to find a lot of similarity. But the, co the thing about proteins is similarity is not good enough. Proteins are so highly specific that a difference of one to three amino acids makes a, pro a protein that, uh, that is uh, dramatically represents a very dramatic difference in biochemistry. And, very, and so it's very specious the way they make these comparisons. Exactly, Neff. And a good point, too, is that a lot of these RNA genes, they're even more cell and tissue specific 
in their expression than the protein coding genes themselves. It's like they're doing the work behind the scenes, right? So like you pointed out, a lot of these similarities that they're looking at um, come directly from the protein coding regions. And yet we know that the non-protein coding regions are highly functional in um, unimaginable ways. Yes, and they have huge tracks. Of, of DNA in the human and chimpanzee genome that don't align, that evolutionists don't like talking about that. I, I think something else that, uh, in terms, I think this applies specifically to the evolutionary arguments is the, you know, they, they argue that the Hox genes, you know, because they're so similar, are, you know, indicative of the common descent. But I'm like, okay, if all of these different animals have the exact same core function data but it's expressed in exponentially different ways right how does that not make you begin to contemplate wait a minute there must be some other variables that are making this happen not just the core hox gene and then obviously that you know i'm sure there's who knows how many things that we don't even understand yet or haven't even discovered in terms of how these this information is actually expressed but just the gauging on the few things that we do know, you know, the gene regulatory networks, microRNAs, and you know, go on and on about those that ultimately end up resulting in entirely different body plans. Right. Yeah. To well, focus your argument on the, the root of the Hox genes as the, you know, the profound argument in favor of evolution to me just seems like you're missing the forest for the trees, both, uh, uh, proverbially and costly, you're suspending any rational thought to, to look at those arguments. It, it, exactly right. And, and the thing is, we're looking at like the functionality of the genome as a whole. And um, in, in her whole argument in question here to G-Man, she is um, pretty well I insisting that these nested hierarchical patterns that we see in, in DNA and the, and the DNA differences that uh, separate, you know, species is uh, only evidence for universal common descent. But as we, as we say over and over again, you know, we don't expect um, all the, the evolutionary leftovers, all, all the junk that, that they would uh, pretty much have to expect over millions and millions and millions of years of, of evolution. And, and kind of like as, as was talked about uh, earlier with the expression profiles that are totally different even in similar genes between, let's say, humans and chimps, right? They're expressed totally different, which is exactly um, what we predict based on, you know, functionality. Like, for example, genes associated with, um, you know, cell um, signaling, the brain cell transport, for example, even um, like a tremendous amount of metabolic functions show distinctly different expression levels between humans and chimps like where's where's the evidence that that these highly important genes evolved you know th th there's no evidence nor even a mechanism for how it could happen that's exactly right that's exactly right so i mean um matt i know uh, i think you wanted to touch on that uh question and and um section that erica was talking about with G-Man there. Well, yeah, and she brought up cats, right? And so she basically was saying, well, how can we know if all cats are related if they have a more genetic different diversity? It's kind of like, well, wait a minute. We don't just look at overall genetic similarity and then walk away. That's that's missing the entire process, basically. That's stepping back and you lose some, like Neff was saying, right? When they started uh, testing everything, they realized, well, hey, they removed 25% of the human and 18% of the chimp, chimp genome so they can get that high percentage number. Well, why did they remove those parts? Because they didn't align. See how crooked they have to be? See how much they have to go to like really get those numbers? We know cats are related for a multiple different variety of reasons. For one, we know that cats are related because you can take the skin off of any living cat today and graft it onto any other cat and it'll take. So you can remove the house cat skin and put it on a cheetah or a lion and it'll graft because they are related. And that's one that's one of the multiple ways we can know relation. See, what happened is uh, I think what was going on is uh, uh, the person who invented the Behrman uh, term himself in the 1960s, he, did, he coined the term. 
a matter of fact, I think in 1941, it was Frank Lewis Marsh who coined it back then. And he used the biblical Noah's Ark definition of a kind, whatever brings forth. Matter of fact, I think he stated the ability to hybridize and create viable offspring was sufficient enough for a member of the family to be in the same kind or the same bearman. Those were his words. So that's where people get really confused. They're like, well, bring forth after their kind. But that's not the Genesis definition of it, right? So that's what we want to know is because what is the general definition of the Genesis meaning of kind? Well, that's where, that's where it comes from organisms that descend from the same ancestral gene pool. That's what yeah. creationists need to be saying. So we always go for function. That's the key word. So when you see these taxonomically restrictive orphan genes, well, do they exist in, in, in different walks of life? And if they do, why? What are their functions? That's what it comes down to. Not do we share them, but what's the function difference? So that really becomes another, fun, another key word. So, um, you know, that was really all I wanted to touch on. She brought up cats and then wanted to stump them. Like, well, why is there more differences in cats? There aren't more differences in cats. Um, the thing is, is they exclude what we don't count and what they did count. That's all. Right. And, and I think you touched on a really good point there with the um, with our definition of, of kind. You know, what is a kind? Well, a kind is a group of organisms, any group of organisms that descend from the same ancestral gene pool. That means that reproduction and breeding tests, you know, that is a way for us to, as, as, a, first, as a first guess or a first approximate as to, you know, what's related, if they can reproduce. But we know that there are some animals that, you know, don't necessarily reproduce, but they're of the same kind. But that's why uh, we always say that it's, you know, it's, it's genes and traits that are inherited, not a fossil, not a rock, not geography, for example, but genetics. So that's where, as you implied, we can look at, uh, you know, taxonomically um, restricted yet essential genes, um, you know, orphan genes. We can look at the same thing in the endogenous retroviruses. We can look at uh, patterns of, of DNA function, DNA barcoding, which we'll touch on. Um, you know, which we'll obviously touch on later on how to determine kind. So there's so many different ways that that we can go about in determining what um, what organisms actually belong to the same created kind, because we know that they have all descended from the same ancestral gene pool. So I would say to any creationist that just defines it as you know those that can bring forth. Um, Unfortunately, just defining it that way may get you caught in a corner because, you know, they can't, there are some that don't necessarily bring forth, let's say, you know, for genetic reasons, but uh, through the number of ways that, that we've just gone over, that's how we can actually determine what's, what's related and what's not. What do you think, Jason? Speak up. Oh, sorry. I was, <laughs> I was just trying to organize my, uh, something on my computer. And I wasn't paying attention. I've been having trouble with my internet slow on one and, and normal on the other, which has been taking all of my attention away. I'm very sorry about that. I, I'm sorry, mate. I don't have anything at the moment. I was just sorry. I'm just my attention's taken away trying to set up something <laughs> on my computer. Okay. We got a lot of mate. ahead of us. I have something to say. SMT's Jump in there, audio brother. Is better now. <laughs> I fixed it. <laughs> well, I, when Neff started talking, I <laughs> I jumped out and 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 you know I definitely don't want Erica to accuse us of not answering the question. We did, but um, you know at the end of the day, she is agreeing that you know creationists uh, would say that you know all cats, for example, the you know the jaguar, house cats, tigers, lions are related through common ancestry. Like you know that's that's pretty general. Uh, but we don't say that humans and chimpanzees are related. So technically her question, she she's implying there's an inconsistency because she's like, okay, so you're saying that house cats and tigers are related, yet house cats and tigers are separated by more DNA differences than humans and chimpanzees. Therefore, why are you not concluding that humans and chimpanzees are not related as well? Like the, she's pretty much calling us contradictory. So the simple answer is, and we see this in genetics, is that humans, um, as, as a human race, we have low genetic diversity. God only created two human beings, Adam and Eve, that's it. And yet we see that in our genetics. That's why the evolutionists had to resort to the hypothetical population bottleneck in the out of Africa scenario to reduce that homogeneity, right? But with 
animal kinds, God created populations. And I think sometimes creationists forget this too. In the creation event, God created animals in bulk, not just two cats, not just two dogs. Uh, you know, sometimes they confuse that with the ark story where God said to bring two of every kind. That means we would expect a higher genetic diversity in animals. So that's why something like a house cat and a tiger can still be related, yet be separated by more DNA differences than, say, humans and chimpanzees, because animals have a far greater ability to vary. So that is a direct answer to Erica's, um, Erica's question and challenge. Does that make sense, guys? Because I just I, I don't I, I fear that she's going to say, well, I wasn't telling you to prove why they're related. Like she's pretty much conceding that, yeah, OK, all the cat, all the cats in the cat family are related. But why? She's trying to say it's a, a contradiction. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah, got it. And one quick thing I want to uh, for uh, Col or K. Lub. I'm not an evolution. I'm actually a polemicist against evolution. Um, I guess you probably heard that I'm probably agnostic when it comes to the age of the earth, but I do believe everything is young when it comes to life. So I'll put it that way. Um, and, and, you know, I, I always find that amazing because, you know, emotionally stunted emoticon, he has backed away from that argument because he's used that argument before, right? Because I generally will point out the fact that, hey, every single human being on the planet is no less than, you know, 99.9% .9 similar. Why is that? And then you look at the chimp and the human Y chromosomes, which I challenged Erica with in, in our first debate. And, uh, you know, she lacked a response, which is, which is fine. But, you know, why is it so dissimilar between chimp and human Y chromosome if they're supposed to be the closest uh, related, according to, you know, their uh, theory of universal common descent? So, um, yeah, that's why they resort to the out of Africa scenario. But then someone like emotionally stunned in Monacan, he, he'll bring up the higher genetic diversity that's seen in the animal kinds. But that's simply because God created animal kinds in bulk. He created humans, two humans. That's it. We'd expect low genetic diversity in, uh, in, in humans. So either way, they can't get out of that. They, they can't get out of the genetic facts is, is what I'm saying. You guys want to do part two of the video now or? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, this time it should be better audio. So apologize for the bad audio. I mean, this wasn't bad. It was just kind of muffled a little bit. I think that with regards to your first, I, I want to make a quick comment about radiometric dating. Right. So I've seen, I again, I was a young earth creationist when I was in middle school and uh, very, very lightly into high school. Um, but they told us the same thing. Um, and they, they had a lot of different sort of examples, usually from Mount St. Helens or, or New Zealand volcanic rock and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I found that compelling at the time, but once I looked into it, right, one, you can't date brand new volcanic rock because they're physically you can't like the, there's there hasn't been enough decay to actually get an accurate reading. That's why you get wild readings all across the clock, because they're not enough decay has actually occurred. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, in conjunction with that, radiometric dating is vitally important to the natural gas industry, the oil industry and the coal industry. And they right. use evolutionary assumptions, quote unquote, uh, to find these things, you know? So, uh, you know, while I think, you know, to summarize, right, one, there's a huge problem with the, the examples that creationists use. And two, they completely never touch on, at least in my experience, the hundreds upon thousands of times radiometric dating has yielded correct dates to the degree in which that it impacts our economy greatly. So do you guys want to respond to that? Yes, I do. That is that is me right there. First of all, geologists are not looking at evolutionary time scale maps when they go looking for oil. Erica just said they use evolutionary assumption to find these things. That's completely wrong. Oil That's a lot of rubbish. Yeah, oil finds are often next to what are called salt domes. Geolo geologists look for these things. Salt domes are basically mounds or columns of salt that have been intruded upwards or in circles, basically, underneath the ground, but underlying sediments. But why is oil always found next to these things? 
because salt domes make an excellent trap for hydrocarbons. Salt domes are always found like worldwide next to gas and oil companies. Basically, they go looking for these things. They That's how they know that they're going to find oil is if they find a salt dome. So that's what they specifically want to hunt down. They spend billions of dollars looking for these things. I mean, it's incredible. Now, uh, you know, what model do they use? The evolutionary model, like Erica says? Nope, not at all. They use... Uh, <laughs> They, I don't know why anybody would think they would use the evolutionary model look for, for that. They use magnetic models. Basically, they look for magma flows to see how thick and viscous oil is. Then besides that, they use, uh, what is another one, oceanic currents. Because has, have you ever gone to a beach and looked out over the ocean? You notice how you always find those oil drilling wells out there? Why is that? They know that salt is in the ocean and that these, and these salt things go in basins. And usually the basins are where they're at, but they're also out at the outer at sea a little bit. The closer you get in uh, to these docks, the more often the ocean accumulates there and it pushes the salt inward and it, and it kind of like docks itself almost. And then underneath you get these plumes of salt domes that build up and right next to the dome is where these oil things are. So that's what's happening. That's what they're looking for. They're not using evolutionary geology paradigms for this. It's not like, oh, it was because of evolution this formed. That's completely nonsensical. So I, I, I see this correlation made completely wrong all the time. They go, well, evolution is the reason we have medicine or vaccines. That's completely not true as well. They have yeah. nothing to do with it. Cell theory is the bedrock of biology. Emergence is the universal theme of biology. Evolution is just an extension of that. The bedrock of medicine is germ theory of disease. It has nothing to do with uh, evolution theory. <laughs> So you see where I'm going with this. What she's saying doesn't correlate. She's saying that without evolution, we would not be able to find what? Oil? It's just ridiculous. <laughs> not using evolution. That's, that's it gets worse for him than that, Matt, because uniformitarianism can't explain the existence of those salt domes either. Uh, you have to have catastrophism to be able to create that kind of sodium that quickly. It, it's irrational to believe that there's any mechanism inside the, the, the uh, geologic column for the collection of so much salt in one location. The only thing that can explain the existence of a, of a salt dome is chemical uh, processes under heat and pressure during the Noahic flood. That's the only mechanism that could even make these salt domes. But it's irrational to believe that, that, in, that, that so much sodium would be created by natural processes in one place over hundreds of millions of years. That's irrational. And they can't even explain the oil that way because... I mean, the scientific community is slowly waking up to the false idea that oil is a uh, is a uh, it's a biological product that it's uh, you know it's a it's a fossil fuel, and they're coming around to, to understanding slowly that uh, oil is actually a chemical product. It was produced by heat and pressure during the Noahic flood. They'll not they're not going to mainstream science won't accept the flood, of course. But imagine if it were a fossil fuel. Was there once a pile of animals that was a mile high? on the earth so that they decayed and all the oil just seeped down into the earth and got trapped in one place? How does that even work? How do you get all that oil from all these plants and animals that have died to gather into one gigantic pool locked up inside the rocks in the earth? And what did it, did it, did, was there some tractor beams or something stuck in the oil through the strata, all of the geologic columns so that it collected in one place? Or was there a pile of, of dead bushes and trees and, and vines that was 20 miles high that eventually decayed and the oil collected? It, there's just no mechanism for a fossil fuel uh, mechanism uh, to create that kind of oil collected in one spot in the geologic column. On top of that, we all know that the oil wouldn't be under pressure like it is still today if it were under the ground for millions of years because the pressure in the earth, which is enormous, would have uh, pushed the oil out through fissures in the rocks and the pressure dissipated millions of years ago. So the fact that oil is even found under pressure everywhere it's discovered discredits uniformitarianism right there. So they can't even explain the salt dome, the oil, or the presence of the oil in one location under pressure. They just don't have a mechanism for it. The Noahic flood could explain it, but uniformitarianism cannot. Exactly. 
exactly. I, I don't know why. One of the biggest mistakes she's saying is that um, if they use the evolutionary model to do it. I, I Did she actually say something about the age of the rocks has something to do with it as well? Because that is, that's absolutely ludicrous. There's no... <laughs> yeah, she's literally saying that uh, based on the assumption of uniformitarianism, um, you know, this is the reason why these big businesses are able to find and locate um, oil, you know, just like you guys demolish. So, yeah, that's literally what she's saying. Someone who has a family member who is a expert rated geophysicist and I've had conversations with them about this. Yeah, the not even close to what as everybody else is saying, not even close to what they're actually doing. And the levels of technology development uh, enabling to do imaging of the potential well sites and stuff is, yeah, radiometric dating has absolutely zero to do with that. It's not even, not even remotely considered factor. <laughs> And then I love that, like, if you get right down to it, just like Brother Neff was saying, that the best explanation for the uh, origin of oil, anyways, is um, is confirm is confirmation of the flood and the flood de deposits, because you would need all of that, um, all those fossils to even explain the origin of, of oil to begin with. So I mean, on on those points, she's over two. And you see R.J. Downard, he uses that same argument. Um, quite frequently, so I think that they just kind of circle that argument around. Mm -hmm. and, and if oil were a fossil fuel, there should be boneyards all around fossil, uh, I mean, uh, oil uh, deposits that, that didn't turn into the oil. You know, that was unprocessed by nature to turn into oil, but they don't find these boneyards. You know, something else that you were mentioning in NEF in context of the pressure requirement for the oil to have been literally pushed into the rocks is a uh, technology they're actually working on right now to release it is uh, giant micro microwave cannons to literally shoot down into the rock heat it up and call it like basically over create the vent port um for the oil to just come out through uh, come out of after being excessively uh, heated up enough um because because as the point you're making the pressure is still there to enable that to happen. That's interesting. I hadn't heard about that. And then I, I think the I think she finishes off their praise more so on was that all she had to say about the radiometric dating or did she have something more? I know there's something that yeah. There's a there's a picture at the end so you know what it finishes. It's actually a person in the comment section that that actually debunks her himself <laughs> <laughs> because I know uh, Matt you you debated her recently on this channel and, and she you know uh, because she likes to use the radiometric dating and uh, isochron dating for example and that the assumptions that usually we point to in, in the dating methods don't matter um, you know for, for, for that reason of, of isochron dating and you um, obviously you refuted her on, on those points um, using some very specific type arguments and experiments. Can you elaborate on those? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of hard to sum up real quick, but I'll, I'll try to do it. Basically, it's completely overturned because it doesn't matter how accurate they are. They can even be 100% accurate as giving the time that they give because the formation of the elements were predicted by Walt Brown. And basically, the evidence conflicts with the evolutionary time scale. You see, Walt Brown predicted that as the flood began, stressors in the massive fluttering crust of the Earth's granite rock from water surging through it, the quartz crystal that is inside the granite generated a piezoelectric effect. And for weeks, this powerful electric surges within the crust, they much like bolts of lightning, they produce powerful magnetic force that squeezed through the atomic nuclei, causing them to be fused together into highly unstable super heavy elements that quickly fissioned and decayed into subatomic particles and various isotopes. But some of them are radioactive, like uranium, lead, argon, rubidium, potassium, strontium, basically in the exact same proportions that we find them on Earth today. The Proton-21 laboratories in Ukraine used this method for 
create using lightning to strike small pieces of metal and it not only created all the elements that we have on earth but it created the elements in the exact same proportions that they are on earth today you see elements were proposed to be started out as heavy radioactive elements that slowly decayed from their parents to the daughter into lesser more stable elements as time went on that's the story that is told to us on how the earth came to be right from the sun but what happens is if these elements were formed at the same time with both parent and daughter isotopes present then that throws off any and all theories that say radiometric dating is valid to prove that the earth is old they say that heavy elements only form from supernovas and decay into what we have today on the earth but that's exactly what the evidence has shown not to be matter of fact they've actually shown that you can only get up to iron which is like what number 26 on the periodic table so this so back to answering jordan right because he said well noah would have been radioactive himself and his family they would have never been able to survive because what happens is the body would have heated up and it would have exploded basically jordan was saying in his debate with bill he said this radioactive isotopes were already within the body and this alone would have killed noah during the flood he doesn't explain why but basically what he is saying is that if there was potassium radioactive potassium named, named potassium 40 if it was inside the human body it would have absorbed the radioactive ions in the air and we would have heated it up and we would have melted inside we would have just died well he assumes that noah's body already had these elements inside of them but remember potassium was not yet potassium 40 ra radioactive because it he he was a pre-flood human being you see potassium in nature only occurs in ionic salts so if there were no radioactive elements in the earth prior then none of it would have been in noah because he would have not consumed any food with it potassium 40 would have only been inside of noah's family if they consumed foods with this radioactive form of potassium in it see what i mean and this could have only happened if they had consumed food grown in soil containing it since no solid or, or so i'm sorry sorry since, since no soil actually had it in it back then then noah nor any of his family would have had potassium 40 in them only regular potassium the natural forms of potassium react rapidly to atmospheric oxygen so that's where he's coming down with that idea. So the second that new radioactive isotopes were introduced during the flood, the soil everywhere became filled with it. That's why it's new. You see the highly soluble water of potassium in crops is, is a reality. That's why when you go buy bags of fertilizer, they know that plants only need NPK. Well, the case stands for potassium because crops we require it. So all food grown today has radioactive potassium inside of it because potassium has an affinity to absorb radioactive isotopes. This means that all foods with potassium have, or, or, sorry, after the flood would carry the new potassium 40, but no pre-flood food would have. So Noah would have not had that problem. So that answers Jordan's question basically. And it's why Jordan doesn't understand that Noah wouldn't have been killed with uh, been walking around as a living time bomb, as he said. Also, uh, he said, what about the heat generated from Noah's flood? Wouldn't that have been a problem? Well, no, that's not a thing either because the equipment that was used at the uh, Proton 21 laboratories generated tremendous amounts of heat. But the heat was absorbed in the process called adiabatic because when you make uranium atoms from smaller atoms, the nucleus of these atoms are squeezed so tightly together that it overcomes the columbum force, which wants to repel heat particles. Uh, Dr. Adam Blanco actually calls it cold packing. So basically to conclude all this, they have not only discovered that nothing over iron can be formed on the periodic table that can be created from a supernova. Therefore, that's invalidating that the Earth got its element from the sun and created our Milky Way galaxy. It also invalidates radiometric dating and it validates our method of dating. And it also falsifies any harm that may have come to Noah from the heat generated and only walt brown's theory lines up with what the evidence actually is walt brown's predictions have been tested and validated on every single level and we can see them at the proton 21 laboratories i think that's incredible it's amazing and and uh i think that's obviously why evolutionists love to mock walt brown when you if, if you mention any of walt brown's work they say oh yeah walt brown <laughs> Yeah, sure. Because <laughs> they do that because they know that his science is profound. They don't even understand most of it, but they have to mock it because they're going to mock anything a creationist says, right? Yeah, they mock Jensen as well. They can't do anything against him. It's great. And then wouldn't a lot of the heat, the excess heat that they say is a problem for us, wouldn't a lot of, a lot of that have been shot into space by the supersonic jets? 
So not only is there a buffer in the water, but also space has something to, to do well, with it too, right? Yeah, because uh, remember, if the canopy was just a few miles up above the earth. Not only was the water going up there, it was freezing and coming back down and falling into the water as frozen ice pellets, like really big, massive clumps of ice. So that was what was freezing animals alive in lakes that were trying to get out of it. It was freezing fish completely still as they were swimming. That was oh. instantly. A lot of stuff inside the earth came out when the flood uh, uh, occurred during the early stages of the flood. Uh, the uh, water under enormous pressure inside the earth uh, eroded a massive amount of material from inside the earth and deposited on the continents. Now, I'm not saying that's the, that's the explanation for all the sedimentary strata on the continents. I'm just saying that would have surely added a lot of stuff. And it likely explains also the iridium layer that's global that evolutionists right. claim was produced by a, a catastrophic uh, comet impact or, or, or asteroid impact on the earth. Probably wasn't uh, any uh, asteroid impact. It was likely uh, iridium that was inside the earth that, that, that came gushing out in the water and deposited globally and that's why there's a layer of iridium everywhere great point great point and it's just like everything we see in, in geology suggests rapid plate tectonics right meters per second plate movements in the past um, just as catastrophic plate tectonics would suggest that's the best explanation for mountains anyways but that uh, runaway subduction um, how fast they're moving would explain some of the um, the heat that's necessary to speed up the decay. But I find it so fascinating what um, everything you just explained, especially with that experiment, Matt. Because I think even when you were uh, debating Erica, um, she seemed uh, fascinated by it as well in that she pretty much had to just say, hey, I've never heard of those papers. Maybe they're new. Can you send me them? Um, but I think, as you iterated, it's just a lack of, um, well, from Walt Brown. Like, the evolutionists pretty much want nothing to do with him, and anytime they hear anything coming from him, they just scoff, like Neff said. Oh, yeah. I mean, she goes, so this must be new information. I'm like, no, the Proton 21 Laboratories in Ukraine has been doing this for over 10 years now. It's not new. But see, what happens is, uh, unless it's posted on like AIG, they don't think we study it, right? They think we just go to like one creationist place and that's all we study and we don't look at creation literature anywhere else. So one of their big downfalls. Uh, by the way, it looks like you've got a super chat. The evolutionists don't pay attention to our arguments if they're founded upon secular papers. So <laughs> if, they, <laughs> if you can quote them, show them, send them, and uh, they still deny, even if it's a atheist who disagrees with their fundamental position. And, and another big thing, too, when we go into debates with these evolutionists, we understand their side. You know, we understand evolutionary theory and we just we reject it. But we can argue and win against them for that reason, because we understand our opponents. But the evolutionists, when they come in to debate us or have a discussion with us, they're not up to date on our best arguments. They don't even understand the model. So therefore, they're arguing against the straw man. And a lot of the discussion is unfortunately left uh, talking past each other. And you can see that with um, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen when he debated Herman Mays. Herman Mays had, I think, six months or a year to prepare by reading uh, Jensen's book. And they were going to talk predictions together, for example. But one of the main points of um, you know that Jensen makes, and is an argument that I, I typically make too, is that the vast majority of our nuclear DNA differences are the result of divine creation. Um, and, and Herman made straw man that because he was saying, okay, the, mo the, the the mitochondrial DNA based on observed mutation rates goes back just 6,000 years. Okay, well, how do you explain the fact that nuclear DNA would go back even further than that? And Jensen, you know, kept asking uh, Dr. Mays, he said, well, what's my explanation for nuclear DNA? And Herman Mays said, well, I don't, I, I don't know, you know, why don't you tell me? But that's the thing, like, Herman Mays was supposed to already know. And um, the fact that we attribute the majority of DNA differences to divine creation, therefore we would predict that the vast majority of our DNA is, is functional and, and not the result of mutations over time, they don't know this. So then they bring up arguments that are pretty well directly addressed simply based on um, the understanding of that basic premise. We got a super chat from Caleb. Um, so I'll, I'll read it. Thanks for your super chat, Caleb. He asks, for whoever, do you 
believe evolution is incompatible with the Bible? If so, why? So who wants to answer that? Go ahead. I'll answer it. Uh, evolution is completely incompatible with the Bible. The Bible makes it clear that God created the language of the of the scriptures is uh, because of the context. It's literally 24 hour day creation uh, days. Uh, Hebraists universally agree upon this. The language in the Hebrew doesn't allow for the gap theory of the day age theory it does not allow for it. And so these are actual creation days. Uh, according to the scripture, God created everything in six literal days. If you do the timelines and study the genealogies of the Bible, the Bible makes it clear the earth is roughly 6,000, possibly 61 or 200 years old. And Jesus Christ acknowledged creation in the beginning by quoting Moses. He said, have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? So, end of story. The Bible is completely incompatible with evolution, or rather, the other way around. Amen, brother. And I always say, why throw out a perfectly good Bible for a dumb theory that has absolutely no evidence for it? Yet, even just understanding Genesis literally, right? The creation of Adam and Eve, the global flood, for example, the Tower of Babel, and how we all, uh, you know, can be traced back to Noah's three daughters in law. I mean, all of these make testable predictions and they're all scientifically accurate. So, uh, accepting evolution rejects the plain reading of scripture and rejects science. Exactly. Unfortunately, we don't have to compromise scripture because science is on the side of the Bible. Exactly. Exactly. Great point, Neff. Thanks for the super chat there, brother. Um, yeah, the, that's fascinating, Matt. I mean, you, you, well, what's nice is it was a double whammy because you just demolished uh, Jordan and his arguments as well as Erica and her arguments too. So uh, unless you guys have something more to say on that specific topic, uh, should we move to the next section? Yeah, I do. Matt, Matt's explanation of that subject was extraordinarily good. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, move to the next one. Matt, you're the master at that topic, brother. I I wouldn't even want to pretend to be an evolutionist and argue with you on that. <laughs> they also <laughs> find water. They also find water in Mexico when they drill down looking for oil. Um, they find fresh water, great big caverns, pockets of high pressure fresh water. Um, also, they've got fresh water seeping up through the all around the ocean floor around Mexico. They've got water seeping up through the ocean, fresh water seeping up through the ocean floor everywhere because of the pressure down there. Um, water can't get down there to replace that water uh, that's down there because it's under so much pressure. It's, it's all it's pushing up. So, and, and it's coming up out of the deep sea vents, but getting back to the oil thing, it's, it's often when they're drilling down, they're finding water and oil. I mean, water instead of oil, what they think was oil, they find water. So if there's fresh water down in these pockets, it's just it's just getting back to the where the water actually came from in the first place for the flood. It, and it at the end of the flood, God said, make the oil, make the water recede, or tell, told the water to recede. Only a supernatural event could make that water go back down. I mean, they, re they think there's up to three oceans worth of water down there. So if that was still up here, we'd be mostly underwater. Great point. Great point. It's interesting you bring that up. Actually, the uh, most recent report I saw on that was they actually are projecting there is greater volume of water underground or like deep under uh, under the uh, crust than on the surface. As of the most yeah. recent, uh, if that water yeah. is left over, it's remnant from what was left, what was in the earth that came out to flood the earth. Uh, it, it's the remainder. Uh, and it, it, it's fresh water because the oceans didn't become salinated until, or at least not uh, seriously so, until after the flood. It was the flood yeah. of Noah that caused the oceans of the earth to become highly salinated. And the rate at which the salination of the oceans is increasing refutes uniformitarianism. It's happening much too fast. If the, if the oceans were, were a billion years old, they'd be so full of salt that it would choke the life out of the vast majority of organisms in the oceans. And then, and then another thing they'll say too, right? When you attribute a lot of these things to the flood or, or we bring up the uh, global flood as, as an explanation, they'll say, oh, you know, that's just post hoc ad hoc. And, you know, they're looking for testable predictions. And, you know, this kind of brings me back to my debate with Godless Engineer. I said, well, the funny thing is we've made testable and falsifiable predictions that flow directly from an understanding of, of the global flood model. And, and Neff talks about this prediction as well with the, um, with the huge slabs of, of, of cool rock that have been discovered 
at the base of, of, the, of the mantle because we know based on catastrophic plate tectonics that if these plates are moving at you know rapid meters per second uh, speeds and they're being pushed down, then they obviously haven't had enough time to melt. And yet what have we discovered um, in, in seismic tomography is we've actually discovered that these slabs of rock exist at the, at the base of, of the mantle. That means they have only just been pushed down there recently since they haven't melted. And that was a prediction made by, who is it, Dr. John Baumgartner, and then discovered after the fact. And there's, we can go on for obviously forever on those, on those predictions. And then they'll just have to like have their fingers in their ears and say, no, 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 that's not, you know, a testable prediction, but that's exactly what it is. Now, all right. My presentation is titled Intelligent Design and Why It is Inferior to Evolution in Every Conceivable Way. This is, of course, by me, Erica, your, your gentle and modern primate, speaking to the rest of you gentle modern apes out there. And uh, this is actually a picture of myself and a couple of my colleagues in 2015 uh, recreating the March of Progress, which is that famous, uh, albeit slightly inaccurate, classic evolution photo in Old Divai Gorge in Tanzania, which is actually where they find a great many uh, hominin specimens. But let's go ahead and start. So what are we discussing today? Well, what we are discussing is intelligent design in its young earth creationist context and in its viability in explaining the biodiversity of life on earth when compared to evolutionary theory. What we're not discussing is the Big Bang, the formation of stellar bodies, abiogenesis, analogs to various non-biological entities such as cars and computer code, outdated literature from 1980 and before, and quotes from specific scientists without full context. So, what is intelligent design? Let's define it. Well, generally speaking, it's the theory that life or the universe uh, cannot have arrived by chance and it was designed or created by some intelligent entity. But in young Earth creationist context, which is what, what G-Men would be based off of my cursory analysis of him, it's that living, organis living organisms rather, are created more or less in their present form by an intelligent designer. And this is intelligent, like ID proponents are almost exclusively linked to those who hold uh, religious beliefs, which I find very interesting because if we're following... Do you want to pause it leads, there, Brother Pray? You'd think that there would be some... Um, yeah, I, I don't have to start on this. Did uh, Naf or, or Jason, did you guys have anything to say on the first couple slides on the ID well, section? Let me talk about this thing, thing for a second. This yeah, um, talking about uh, ID. I, I I quoted her when I, in my my notes. She says uh, ID oh. is almost exclusively linked to religious beliefs. However, so but the truth is though, the so is evolution. The truth is evolution is a religious philosophy. So that's a really uh, it, it's an attempt to paint the, create the idea that there's a war between the Bible and science and science wins when the truth that that's not the truth at all. So evolution is not science, it's philosophy and and it's actually held to with religious ardor and faith by these proclaimers so uh, that that's a very specious thing to say because the truth is evolutionism is very much religious just like uh, theology is religious so it's an attempt to create a, a false contra uh, claim uh, that uh, it comes down to a war between science and religion when everybody who's in, and understands this controversy about evolution knows that's not the case. It's not science between uh, and religion. It, it's between their idea of science, their philosophy versus real science. Awesome points. Awesome points. I totally agree with you that they're, you know, they're hijacking the words science when what they actually believe in is is a philosophy. And that's why you'll point out the fact that um, everything we observe in biology, everything we observe in, in genetics points to biblical creation. Mutations, which they say are the source for all variety, are deleterious. They're detrimental to uh, the genetics of, of, our, of the human race, of uh, animal species. And now, uh, you know, the more we know about the functionality of the genome, it just makes the problem even worse for them. So when they want to say that, you know, a single celled organism evolved into a multi celled organism and then into an, a fish, an amphibian, you know, a, a reptile, a 
bird, a monkey, a man. I mean, this is a philosophy. And, you know, they can believe it, capital B, and, and they can imagine it, capital I, all they want. But just like you pointed out, Neff, it's, it's nothing more than, than a philosophy. It's anti-science. T-Jump um, had a spaz attack when he was debating John Maddox on this. Uh, he says, it is um religion intelligent design no, you're not gonna you're not gonna it's it's impossible for you to tell me that intelligent design is not religion remember do you remember that john I mean, that's like so hard he almost well, well, his vein I'm, was I, coming out of his head i i do remember that of course we are talking about the same person who thinks there's no difference between two rocks bashing together and uh computer code but uh <laughs> <laughs> the, and I, I wish I was saying that uh, as a joke and not actually literal words from him, but the something else I think is kind of interesting and often gets kind of left out in the whole uh, ID versus evolution discussion is uh, an SFT, as you were just talking about on the mutation rates and, oh, that's what's causing the changes. As they're discovering now, yeah, you know, adaptations to environmental factors usually are happening in real time and are either epigenetic factors or the cell being able to literally write new code to account for a modification. I, I find it so interesting when they use, you know, like uh, the immune system as a supposed defense of evolution when for all intents and purposes, it is basically machine learning executing a new uh, function to account for a new variable, not the result of mutation. And then what we're actually seeing from the mutations are, as you said, deleterious and detrimental to the outcome, not the adaptations that are being executed in a very controlled um information processing and, uh, and modification perspective versus random chance. All, muta all mutation does is create death and destruction, cancers, diseases. I mean, I, I, I've yet to, to, to see them show me uh, a mutation that can't be accounted for via epigenetic regulation. Uh, it's it's most of the the mutations like the the Tibetan Sherpas, um, uh, the deep the deep divers. I can't remember what they are. The things like that are just epigenetic. When when it's like it's like rats and mice. If you get the if you get rats and then give like Matt said before, you get give them the smell of fruit, and every time you give them the smell of fruit, you give them an electric shock. Well, they grow these extra they 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 grow these extra senses sensory senses in their nose. And the next generation, even though they've never experienced electric shocks or anything, as soon as they smell fruit, they, they become scared. Um, but that goes away after a while it, within the other generations. And it, that can't be um, mutation. It can't be the mutation selection mechanism. It's far too slow. So it can't be that that's doing that. It has to be epigenetic for things like that to happen. It's the same with the blind, blind cave fish. You get the blind cave fish, it's got a, um, a seeing counterpart to the blind cave fish on the outside of the cave can, can actually um, breed with the brine, still um, interbreed with the blind cave fish. But when you get this fish from outside the cave and you put it into a completely dark environment, <clears throat> um, it, 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 within one generation, it starts to lose its eyes. I mean, evolutionists say that these things came along and they bumped into the wall and and they started to get scratches and the eyes were a, were more of a, a you know working against them more than 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 for them, so they were starting to get these 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 problems. So that eventually the eyes uh, you know went away slow. They don't. They, it happens very quickly. It's it's epigenetic. So this is where epigenetics is just killing ev evolution on every on every level. Good point. And not to mention the fact that, like, since these epigenetic alterations, like you're saying, they never actually add any novel, meaningful information to the genome. They're only... No, they don't uh, grow it. Exactly. They they're only changing... Yeah. They're literally only changing the way the genes are expressed. And, uh, you know, the adaptations that are seen are, are pre-programmed in, into the genetics. They're non-random ad adaptive changes. And then the mutations, as John pointed out, are deleterious or detrimental. The most detrimental ones, natural selection is going to remove. Um, and then the most beneficial ones, let's say sickle cell anemia, which is still reductive and deleterious, selection may amplify, you know, a couple here and there, uh, which are still deleterious is the point. 
But but all, sickle, all your sickle hearing... cell is bad. It, sickle cell can exactly. also if they get two two sides of the the, the both parents have the sickle cell uh, mutation. Sickle cell will actually kill you by the age of ten or eleven. It's only if you've got half the the sickle cell gene that it's actually beneficial to you. Um, because your blood vessels are like little little squishy bags, and the, and the blood vessels, the, the 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 vessels that they squeeze through are smaller than the blood, the smaller than the sorry, the 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 red the blood cells, the red blood cells. So as the blood cell squeezes through the the thing, it it disperses oxygen um, to the to the body and to the muscles. And what happens is that these sickle cells in the when you got the full thing, the these the your cells turn into like little sickle shaped rock hard things that can't get through the the blood vessels and they build up and cause extreme pain and then death at an early age i mean uh, sickle cell anemia is nothing more than loss it's complete loss it's like batman and robin it's like the joker blew up the bridge to stop batman and robin from getting to them um <laughs> it, it, it might be beneficial for a little while but right. it, 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 it's sooner or later they're going to find a way they're going to get to him and 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 whatever but it's it's not it's not um it's not it's not beneficial at all it's sickle cell anemia i don't see it as being beneficial i mean okay fair enough you've got half the side of the gene but you've also opened to other diseases by having that every time you get something beneficial like with the aids virus um or or other things that, that, that like you know people that are immune to the aids virus they've discarded a part of their genome which stops the aids virus from being able to attach to them well they're more susceptible to other diseases and things so we don't ever see anything growing more complex and larger and 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 adding more features it's it's always seems to be reductive well it's, it's a great point it, it's a broken gene or a, a broken cell a broken protein and then you point these things out to you know the evolutionists uh, like um, i remember i pointed that out to godless engineer you can point it out to r and Ra, and they'll just respond like well how do you measure you know information loss how do you know this and it's so funny if, if these genes are breaking or deletions in the genome are resulting in genetic disease a gene that's broken or a gene that's lost implies a loss of some kind. So they know that they're backed up into a corner that all of these so-called beneficial mutations are now turning out to be epigenetic um, <laughs> adaptive changes and the actual mutations themselves, most of them are nearly neutral. So they build up uh, invisible to selection. So they just degenerate us more and more over time. Um, yeah. and then, so they're backed up into a corner. So that's all they can say. Right. Well, what is information loss? And I find it hilarious because, you know, even even though they'll agree that sickle cell anemia is uh, due to, you know, a, a broken or deformed uh, cell. And yet they're going to ask, you know, well, how do you measure information loss? Like it's it's a game with them. It's like um, one of the scientists you had on your show said he said with a with a say take a, a bacterial um, antibiotic resistance, for example, there might be 100 points on a bacteria um, that you can target to kill the bacteria. And every time you target one of those points, the bacteria will discard a protein or a gene or, or something which will deform the, basically it's like a lock and key, which will deform the lock so the bacterial key can't fit. Oh, sorry, sorry, it'll deform the, 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 lock, the lock on the bacteria so the, 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 the antibiotic key can't fit into the lock, but every time, so then they have to develop a new antibiotic and then it gets becomes resistant to that and so on and so on down the line. But each time the bacteria does this, it's becoming weaker and weaker. I mean, mm -hmm. I even heard that the current virus, that, that I won't say the name of it because YouTube uh, AI seems to detect it and, and screw people over on videos that say... The thing, the current virus problem that we're having around the world at the moment, scientists, uh, I heard on the news, I heard a scientist saying that it's actually becoming weaker already, um, but it's not enough. It's not coming becoming weaker fast enough to to save everybody. But, I mean, over time, it'll eventually just become so weak, it'll become, you know, like a cold or a flu or something that's non-destructive. When it comes to mutation, I, I see evolution as scientists like a, a, gr a group of fellows who show up to a costume party, all of them wearing the same clown costume. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> because for 90 years they've been studying the, ge the effects of genetic mutation and the jury's been in for decades already about it. Is they, they cause weakness, deformities, death. That's it. 
They, right. they don't design or build anything. And since that's not true, evolution theory cannot be true. It, it is absolutely a necessity for evolution theory that mutations do these fantastical things that evolutionists have been believing for so long. But 90 years of study in mutations, enough papers that if you printed them all on a desktop printer and stacked them, they'd be a couple of stories tall. And they all describe the negative effects of random mutation. The, the, the clear and obvious thing is evolutionists refuse to accept 90 years worth of science in studying mutation because they have to. Their whole worldview crumbles if the science is to be accepted. So they, they go off into this la-la land in their head. Well, you know, one good mutation outclasses a thousand bad ones. That's how it works. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Evolution doesn't proceed by climbing up a hill by taking 1,000 steps backward and a quarter step forward. You're, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's it's such a great point because like you said yeah one super beneficial mutation that's you know not deleterious which we know that those don't even exist and it doesn't have any effect on body plan or design structural design anyway it yeah, just affects exactly. biochemistry right <laughs> so what we have here is we have a genome that is degenerating on all levels, right? So you're just throwing out all this information and then the evolutionist wants to us to believe that while all this information is being thrown out, you know, it's trying to be made up for by one or two beneficial mutations. Like, sorry, compensating for loss of information is just not possible. And that's why, as Neff points out, it's, it's a philosophy and it's not science and they've hijacked the word science. Um. Yeah, totally hijacked the word science. It's 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 not science at all. It's total pseudoscience. It's total imagination. It's all imagination. It's like pulling bones out of the dirt and, and lining them up. Oh, this one looks like it might have transitioned from that one, and we'll just line them up. It's like it. It, it reminds me of a child putting a, a a simple puzzle together. You know what I mean? Like it's just ridiculous. It's not even really a puzzle. It's just putting. It's ridiculous. There's no rhyme or reason to anything they say or or do. It's all complete imagination. SpongeBob, SpongeBob University. Stuff. And then that's why it, it, it's it's great points. And that's why um, what we see in in the in species, what we see in in changes, is all the more consistent with with our model. You got people like emotionally stunted Emoticon who will say, you know, what is the limits to your model of, of created heterozygosity, for example? Well, if all the changes we see, if all the species that are arising are due to, you know, losses of information of, of some kind, because if you can just picture the original created kinds, Adam and Eve with all these front-loaded functional DNA differences at creation and change and speciation has occurred based on uh, like, for example, you know, to not get too technical, a lot of the times it's you, you can get variety in one generation based on just recombination or um, or, or gene conversion, right? These uh, genetic mechanisms and also shifts from heterozygosity. So some of these more uh, variable genes that are actually it's, it's like genetically, it's like capital A, you know, small A, capital B, small B. But if you have two capital letters. Or, or, or two small letters, then it's all based on the allelic um, variability. So if you're losing information over time and you're going shifts from heterozygosity to homozygosity, when we look back in time as creationists, we're looking back at the, the expansion of the genome while the evolutionist is looking back at the contraction of the genome because they started off millions and millions of years ago as a single celled organism that has had to add novelty. They've had to add uh, new novel information to take their fish to fishermen. So the limits are, uh, it's, it's quite the opposite that we would expect. Like Matt, you pointed out against Erica in your debate that, you know, a lot of these species will eventually hit a wall. There'll be extinction or they will hit a wall in, in their adaptation where they can't really go any further. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, I wanted to tell her even about like, you know, racehorses and things. So, I mean, m no more money spent in ra than racehorses, right? I mean, they'll do anything to get one more mile an hour out of them, but they've maxed out three, three decades ago. They can't get them. The genetic potential of them is stuck. So I, I don't know how else we can explain it. I mean, you were even telling me earlier about horses, right? About how they all are homozygous now. So they, I don't know what else they need as far as how much more they're stuck in what they are. I mean, 
Well, you can you can see it in the fossil record. You can see in the pre-flood world the incredible biodiversity that that existed, and that's why looking to fossils, um, it, there's so much inference and in, in interpretation and storytelling. Because, like Neff pointed out, if if uh, mutations, which should be the creator to the evolutionist, is actually the destroyer, is not going to take your fish to fishermen. Well, looking to the fossil record, looking at some bones and lining them up the way that you hope evolution is going to happen it's, it's based on an assumption that evolution is not true but based on what we know on observed evidence and the lack of ability of their mechanisms to build a genome it's it evolution's false it's it's literally been falsified so the fossil record is, is no is no help to them and the fossil record is is just it, it testifies to a, a pre-flood world you know that that we would uh, believe in Jason's uh, uh, he went out to take the dogs out, so that's why he's not mentioning anything. So if John wants to say something, or else we'll just sorry, on. sorry. What did you say? Oh yeah, I missed it. I was just I was I was here, but I was. But actually, I'll sorry about that. I, I think what Matt said about the horses is a great point because yeah, uh, well they're trying to squeeze one more second or even half a second or a quarter of a second out of horses, and they said that that's it. They've hit the limits to to what they can do now. They they can't. They can't get the horses to run any faster. It's basically there's there's limits to, to the genetics, and, and they're becoming so highly bred and highly strung. They've got really thin legs, and they break their legs easily, more easily than wild horses. And they, you know, they're, they're going downhill. They're not going uphill. And and the species that we see of horses in, in their genetics, as Matt pointed out, their genes for the most part are more so homozygous. You know that. They've had a reduction in heterozygous gene sites. So if you, in our model, people like emotionally stunned and emoticon, they, you know, they accuse us of um, kind of looking to this created genetic diversity, trying to say that it's limitless. Because they'll say, okay, if you believe in all this speciation from the flood, you know, a couple of cats have now speciated in, into all the 30 or 35 different cat species we have today. Well, if you give us a million years and why can't you know we, we take our bacteria like organism in, into a well but what they don't understand is our mode and mechanisms of change is totally opposite of what is required by large-scale pond scum to people evolution because the horse species we see today as and we can go on and on about all the different species they are less um heterozygous than their ancestors on the ark and of course, far less heterozygous than the ancestors at creation. So we're just going downhill and eventually that change is going to reach a dead end. Well, yeah, it is. It's going downhill. It's just going downhill at a rapid rate. Everything's going downhill. It's like the dogs. It's like the horses. It's like every animal on earth, every creature. It's, it's, that's another thing about um, the, 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 the ticking clock. Uh, even though mice have more generations, um, they their mutation rate is slower than us. So they're basically, they're pretty much going downhill at, 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 at about the same rate that we are, which is really, you know, sort of like, I suppose for an evolution, that should be pretty creepy for them. You guys ready for the next? And I wanted to make one point. I, I, I'm going to try and remember this to the best I can. Matt and I were talking about it the other day. Even Aaron Ra, I'm not even sure if he if he knew that he was doing this in one of his videos that we were watching. You know, we'll study the enemy and we'll refute their videos. And he literally he downplayed his own fossil evidence because he showed the variability in a bunch of dog skulls, and and he showed that. Uh, there are within the dog family or within just domestic dogs there is more variability okay in just a bunch of breeds of dogs than there are in say two species that are more distantly related therefore he's downplaying it because he's saying we do need genetics in order to confirm relationship or how far away somebody is is related matt probably remembers when we were talking about this so if we're just looking at a bone found in the dirt Right, because I know um, in in the debate, Erica brought out a, a few specific, uh, you know, bones or trans transitional fossils. But if you don't have any genetics associated with it, all you're going to do is come up with wild um, stories, 
inferences that really aren't even based on reality. You literally need the genetics. Like for example, Adam Heap asked Matt and I, you know, what about Tiktaalik? What kind of animal is Tiktaalik? Well, do you have genes that we can look at traits or what is, are inherited? And he said, no. And then we quickly moved on because a bone in the dirt is open to wild storytelling. Do you remember that, Matt? Oh, that wasn't, yeah, that wasn't long ago at all. <laughs> Inferring. Yeah, bone in the dirt is just a bone in the dirt. It's nothing more than that. It's, 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 it is. It's like it's like childish little games. Like, oh, this fossil look this 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 bone looks like it might have evolved. This skull looks like it might have evolved from this one, and and and, and it's it's. But this one looks like it might have evolved from this one, and so on and so on, and and they're just. It is literally pure imagination. They don't even know if some of these things are the same kind of the same. Species species but just like a younger ape or an older they, they don't have a clue what these no, skulls no. are who they are what they're doing nothing <laughs> it, 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 it's 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 but yet they they portray it to the public as if it's all you know they they know it all they've got it all worked out and they haven't they've got nothing worked out at all and what's funny is we want to and we want to look to the genetics. One last point on Erica's slide there. She said, you know, what we're not here to discuss. And she tried to put like, you know, we're not here to discuss automobiles and things like that. And it's so funny because the reason why she's saying that now is because these evolutionists like Jackson Weed and even Aaron Ra, of course, they don't like our analogies to design modes of transportation, for example, because it it, it, just, it shows that we have a competing explanation because we, we say it over and over again, okay? If God made us in, in his image, then we should get a, we should be able to get a sense for how God designed the biology, how, how God designed life based on the way we design things. And guess what? It just so happens to turn out that we build in homologous patterns, right? Engineers um, use shared de designs. We can see that on all continents on the earth. We can see that modes of transportation even fit these nests and hierarchical patterns. And we can even see that in, in the blueprints too. So we try and point that out that we predict the exact same thing. And now we got to go to the differentiating evidence and all. And then that's when we go to the genetics, we go to the function, we can go to the DNA barcoding, the orphan genes, the uh, functional endogenous retroviruses and all these things, all these things destroy evolutionism because it is the differentiating evidence that destroys evolutionism. So there I thought it was funny because she said, we are not here to discuss you know, automobiles and analogies and stuff. But I'll never, personally, I'll never back down on that, you know, because that is our model. We are looking at the way we design things to get a sense for how God designed the world. So I would say that to creationists or even G-Man, like use those analogies because they work and and, and they hate how, how well it works. Matt and I were just talking about that the other day. Here we go. There's a whole lot of video left. <laughs> religious beliefs, which I find very interesting because if we're following the evidence where it leads, you'd think that there would be some crossover between sort of the, the, uh, the conventional scientists that maybe don't have religious beliefs. So the general arguments from intelligent design are the fine-tuning argument. This would fall into that category of the first group of people, which is the idea that Earth's conditions, both cosmic and local, seem kind of designed for life, as they might be rare. Now, this isn't really relevant to today, uh, and I would suggest that G-Men confront uh, an astronomer or physicist with those ones. But the other one is irreducible complexity. And this is the idea that there are things in nature which are so complex that they could not have possibly evolved by natural processes alone. This is very relevant. So here's some of the classic irreducible complexity arguments is where I thought G-Men was going today. The evolution of the eye, the heart, the flagella, multicellularity, terrestrial living invertebrates, wings and birds, and consciousness, which of course, is in, of course is in quotation marks because consciousness is kind of hard to define. So I thought I'd go ahead and zip through a couple of these really quickly. Because generally speaking, when creationists or ID proponents are talking about the how, wow, it's just confounding, we have no idea how the, the heart or the eye or multicellularity could have evolved, this is not the case. And, and more often than not, it seems to be the case that, that very little or no research has been done on the literature base with regard to, to kind of observations and experimentation that has been done regarding the evolution of such structures or mechanisms. So the eye and the heart, wow, look at this. We've got two very recent papers, one from 2013 and one from 2017, which sort of denote how we, how we track this evolution, both in fossil specimens, in genetics, and of course in living organisms, because many of these steps have living analogs. 
What about the flagellum? Well, there's a great paper from, uh, let's see, 2007, which is a little older than I would like, but I really liked this, this sort of summary here. These results show that the core components of the bacterial flagellum the eye. through the successive Did I just say something? Could you pause that phrase? You there? The eye, the, 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 she talks about the eye, um, how they've got in the fossil record these, these processes, um, these processes that, uh, that, 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 that of these eyes forming and, and hang on, sorry, I'm just doing something. These eyes forming and, uh, you know, but we've got all the same eyes they've got in the fossil record today. I mean, a worm has a type of, um, photoreceptor, some types of worms have a photoreceptor that just shows them light and dark basically so they can get out of the light and not dry out and die. Same with um, some slugs and snails and mollusks. All the stuff they're finding in the fossil record about the eyes is, is the exact same stuff that they're finding um, that they we've got alive today on the, on the earth. So as for the way she says it, it sounds very convincing and she is very good at the way she, she she's a very good talker um but it's 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 with basically everything that she's saying we've we've got all of those same eyes around today and they're just finding the same eyes in the fossil record it's nothing but stasis right but i also would like to talk about the flagellum and we oh, have sorry my Microphone disconnected. Sorry. It's all good. We had Ken Miller, uh, who's Mister uh, Anti Creationist, and and he thought he debunked this uh, flagellar motor by Michael Behe, uh, but they did. But what's funny is they actually <laughs> Stephen Meyer and Dembski, I believe it was those two, but they uh, actually rebuted his uh, refutation, and they showed that something called co option that was. Um, was I think it was uh, yeah, Ken Miller's argument. Well, they found out that the flagellar motor, the uh, the shaft, was in a degraded state. It was so you can't. So they, they originally thought co-option was showing that the shaft. I mean, they could add on each part uh, slowly. But what Stephen Meyer showed is they did genetic knockout tests, and um, if you take one out, the whole thing falls apart. Like it, the, the 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 you know the spinning thing that goes like a thousand miles an hour. The tail. Um, so, yeah, I mean, intelligent design uh, people are more up to date than your stupid evolutionist. I mean, she's tr he's trying to use some of these Ken Miller arguments and uh, about the flagellar motor. Oh, no. What? Right. Oh, no. What? Just ignore him. He's evolving. <laughs> Hold on. Who got kicked? Oh, here we go. The, the idea that the human eye or any eye evolved is, is preposterous. The complexity of the eye is just absolutely mind-bending, stupendous yeah. complexity. The chain reaction of proteins that has to take place to create an electrical impulse in the nerve uh, from each of these uh, rods and cones is just astonishing. That kind of complexity to believe rock yeah. soup is going to make yeah. it over time and mutations will do it, nonsense. Fantasy of the biggest order. Yep, Fla the flagellum, when they knocked um, the stuff out of the flagellum, they knocked so much out of it that eventually it um, that eventually it uh, it turned into a, uh, it, 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 like a little hypodermic syringe needle, yep. but it was very rigid and it couldn't move. And they could only, and, and, and so what the, the, the thing, all the thing could do is basically lie on the bottom. And, and, and also, even if they did, um, evolve this this um, water jet mechanism. It, like I said, it can't move or anything. And where's the the pumping mechanism and everything inside to pump the water out? And how do they change direction? It it's, it, it just doesn't work. It, it couldn't work. They'd just be lying on the bottom. They wouldn't be able to do basically anything. So they've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that that the everything every part. I think there's thirty or forty eight parts. To that flagellum, of, and, and and if just one part is removed, the whole thing stops working. 
So and I, it, it gets worse for them than that. They used to claim that the type 3 excretory ports in the cell membrane is what eventually evolved into the flagellum. The recent, more recent papers in the science journals, the scientists are now uh, believing that the, the flagellum devolved into the type 3 excretory port. All right. So they, don't, the they have no mechanism for the development, no theory for the, <laughs> act, the workable model for the development of the flagellum. You know, when there was that, that trial that uh, Stephen Myers and Michael Behe were in, and uh, the evolutionists allegedly proved the evolution, uh, um, the ID was, evil, uh, was religion. Remember that? Some years back. Uh, on the steps of that trial at the courtroom, some, uh, some evolutionists were asked by members of the press. Uh, Michael Behe said in the courtroom that you guys could test whether or not the bacterial flagellum could have evolved. You could actually test that if you wanted to. Are you guys planning to do it? And their response was, no, we're not going to do that because creationists are always asking us to do their homework for them. Sounds to me like they were afraid. Right. But yeah. the whole case right. was That's corrupt before it even began, though. This was one to talk about with John Maddox when he talked to, uh, it was uh, T-Jump. And T Jump says, "Oh yeah, the Dover case decided intelligent design is uh, pseudoscience." But here's the thing: I don't know if anyone knows this, that the judge was coerced before the even the thing began by the ACLU. Um, the ACLU is an anti-Christian organization. I mean, they hate Christians and they go after them. And this organization well, gave him a there video. Was this super of the rich 1950s. guy there. Yeah. There's one of these guys there from these these super rich families. I won't mention the name of the family. I can't even remember the name, but it's one of the really super top, you know, five in the world type thing. And he was there and he wrote um, out his, um, and this is actually on re trial record. He wrote out what he believed um, should happen in the trial and what the judge should say. And it, his actual spelling was so terrible and his grammar was so terrible that the judge, when the judge spoke out what he said at the, at the end of the trial, he took his side. He took the evolutionist side. He, 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 when he spoke out what this guy wrote, it was almost word for word, except for the spelling mistakes and the grammar mistakes, exactly what the, From the guy the ACLU. on the yeah he read yeah he read the stuff the ACLU told him to read, and the ACLU right. is not even a scientific organization. But here's my question, though: Why the hell? is a judicial system deciding science. Shouldn't scientists be doing this anyway? Why the hell would some, um, you know, in some little area in, in a judicial system there? It makes no sense to me either. That's right. It's, it's ridiculous. And they should be out there doing science and they try to avoid doing things that disprove evolution. That's not science. That is not science. It's not science. If you, uh, uh, okay, oh, we better not do that because that might prove something that, that goes against what we believe, so we won't do that. That's terrible. That's just evil. It is. But did you see what the ACLU gave him to? Uh, this video is called Dust in the Wind in 1950s. And you had these, like, creationists with the... Uh, the flame, like the like, they're trying to do a witch hunt against the evolutionists, you know. And that's, I mean, this is what they were trying to push in his brain and, and, and brainwash him. Um, so the whole thing was corrupted. It's, it was it, the thing was worthless. It was fake. It was corrupt fraud. So I mean, that's what I wanted to let John know. Yeah, well, and, and something else I, I think is interesting on the whole irreducible complexity argument is things, you know. You, taking the eye for example i mean they talk all, they always focus on oh well the lens could have developed and this this and this you know so and so forth into the different components but they never talk about the what's required on the other end of the signal that's being generated from a processing perspective and you know for even a simple eye to exist you have to have a very complex brain to be able to actually and nervous system overall the virtual protons. This right. is your, what, what you're talking about. Absolutely. And then and now with what they're discovering in quantum biology, you're talking about literal quantum tech, if you will, being required for the real time processing of the information. And there's and, 89, 89, I think it's eighty nine thousand billion um, connections, uh, signals going down those virtual protons I I I through the proteins, and that's just in a yeast cell every every second. 
or every whatever. It's incredible. It's it's like one with eighty nine with eighty nine billion zeros after it. Is how many? Yeah. Absolutely. And when, when you think about that from a processing standpoint, I was actually thinking about this earlier today when I was out driving around and I was just thinking about the level of information that was going into my brain every second <laughs> I was driving down that road right. and how, when you think about how many issues do we have trying to do debates and live streams with buffering and breaking up of the audio and freezing of the video <laughs> and all those things that we have and the level of video quality is nowhere close to what is happening in our brains, right? And then yeah. if you if we are actually have relative compared to a huge percentage of animals, we actually have relatively inferior quality of vision compared to many, many animals, right? It's like, okay, so <laughs> that means that higher level of visual processing had to have existed. There's a, there's a type yeah, of crustacean exactly. that can see an amazing amount of colours, like hundreds of times more colours than us. I can't remember the name of it. It's a... Uh, oh, damn, I'm sorry. I can't remember the name of the actual mm -hmm. um, crustacean. But to me, when you really think about that, just from a... And this, this is what I always get. And you guys hear me rant about the whole aspect of, you know, the technology and the coding, the computer processing, artificial intelligence, machine learning and such. But to me, when you really just contemplate that level of data and the other night matt and i were talking about this of you know the latest uh, uh study they have shows that the human brain can store 2.5 petabytes of data and which is just a that, that's a mind blower right there you think about that much information being stored and how our brains humans our brains last 80 90 100 years what other type of uh data storage device of humans ever created that we project to last more than 10 years, yeah. let alone potentially a century. That, that's uh, right. You make a great point, John. On top of that, it just gets worse because think about it. They, uh, the, uh, as, as, as the eyes uh, were imagined, you know, imaginary uh, evolution of eyes would have sponsored and actually caused the evolution of the visual cortex in the brain of an organism would have evolved to to continuously adapt and grow uh, bigger and more complex in in response to more com more and more complex eyes evolving in organisms so that visual cortex in the brain of a human being would have responded been responding to the stimuli from in the from the eyes over millions of years to become what it is now imagine the uh, uh, unfathomable number of random mutations that would be necessary and how much time would be required for that to happen by random mutation assuming random mutation could actually design a chunk of the human brain it it's just preposterous to believe mutations are going to do that, knowing what we know they, the effects of mutations are. On top of that, you would need more time. Scientists have discovered that to, to get uh, Douglas Axe speaks about this quite a bit, uh, to get more than one mutation to accrue to the same gene so that the gene would be changed to have a new function is an exponential amount of time. There's not enough time in the history of the universe. So how many universes worth of time is evolution need to get the mutations to, to work to work together in order to develop the whole visual cortex of the brain in response to the stimulus coming in from these evolving eyes? It's just craziness. Yeah, ninety-seven billion. It's 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 ninety-seven billion years to get eight coordinated mutations. Just wanted to add that, Neff. Sorry. Hey, Cut Neff. No, great. That's great. Your, your point about the eye that was an excellent point. Hey, Neff. Did you hear about uh, Jonathan Wells? He uh, he was addressing some of Richard Dawkins' arguments of poor design. Like Richard Dawkins was talking about the cells in the back of our eyes that they face backwards. Uh, and that was supposedly a, a bad design argument. Well, they found out if these cells were pointing forward, we'd be blind. Uh, of course. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it would burn out the rods and cones. The yep. light it would be too intense. And imagine also... Uh, uh, the, I'm an ex-professional photographer. The iris diaphragm in a camera lens is like those uh, doors you see in sci-fi movies. You know, it opens and closes with leaves. And the, the pupil does it, but without the leaves. I, imagine what, what, how, how is evolution going to put this iris diaphragm inside the eye 
to, so it can automatically vary its diameter to, to change the intensity of the light coming into the eye in response to the, to the uh, automatically as the eye receives more or less intense light depending on where the organism is looking. The idea that that kind of a thing, an iris diaphragm that automatically responds to light input and to make itself smaller or bigger uh, uh, di is just nuts. To believe hey, hey, that Nef these kind of ingenious things evolve because of random mutations is just craziness. Nef let me let me, uh, let me dive here for just a second. I agree with everything you just said because the technology we're discussing is far superior to anything we've ever devised. But I think this actually, what you're talking about, about how did it get inside, right? That That's kind of the point you were making. I think that goes all the way back to the abiogenesis arguments that are being made by the evolutionists of well i agree with you that the, from a chemistry perspective this couldn't happen but hey if the lipid membranes formed and then somehow the rnas got inside of those very simple cell walls then the chemistry could happen to create proteins and so on and so forth and to me when you think about that from a like what is actually a reasonable expectation i agree with you like how did this get inside of the eye that's a whole that from a high level technology perspective that's a whole nother level of wow how could this possibly happen but then how does it back, begin to evolve in place you know but, yeah but then going back to origin of our existence you're having to argue not you the the evolution is having to argue that somehow all of these pieces of technology all came together at the exact same moment on a microscopic level on a they, and they all have a shelf life from a chemical uh, a chemical shelf life right it's like so before they all degraded they all managed to come together and conjoin and then from there just the rest happened and uh, and in water the universal solvent water and they weren't dissolved straight away and they had to have all the right temperatures and all then be start and stop the reactions and and everything it's just <clears throat> it's impossible it could never have happened ever. Not in, not in. Even if they had an, an infinite amount of universes, it would not matter because the laws would all be the same in every single universe, and it would still never happen. Even if they had an infinite exactly. Number. And the eye is superior to man's technology. To make an iris diaphragm for a camera lens, man has to use blades of titanium, uh, and then it has to be motorized. And, and but the human eye, it does it with a stretchy membrane. I mean, it's vastly superior technology to what man makes. Can you imagine a new Canon well, camera comes out, right? And it's got a stretchy membrane for an automatic iris diaphragm in it. What? That would turn the world of photography on its head. I mean, please. Yeah, yeah. why can't they reproduce an eye or a brain in the lab? I mean, that shows you even how complex, or the, the design that's in the cell, I mean, in our genome. <laughs> I, I think that one of the dumbest things that Richard Dawkins has ever done, and I just extrapolate uh -oh. out to the evolutionists, is is the eye argument, right? Of like, why does why is there the blind spot? If you close one eye, why do you? Have that is the eye? dumbest argument. And it's like, well, you have two eyes, you moron, and they overlap, <laughs> and there is no blind spot if you have both eyes open, which you were designed to have two eyes. Therefore, you were designed not to have a blind spot. And not and to mention, if you've just got one eye open, you have to turn your head at a certain angle and hold your eye at a certain angle to see this blind spot. It's actually very difficult to see it. Um, it so it, it's, it's even with just one eye, you won't see this blind spot. Does everyone know that there's 100 trillion photoreceptor cells in each eye, which is more than the stars they know that's in the universe? Isn't that incredible? Wow, that is amazing. They just evolved there. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the universe coming into existence by a, via a, a quantum fluctuation. It's just, and I know I say this a lot, but it, it just gets me how evolutionists believe in invisible laws with no taste, touch. You can't taste them, touch them, smell them, or weigh them. And they're completely invisible, yet they influence everything around us. And yet they believe in these invisible laws, but not the invisible lawgiver that set them in motion. Yep. Anyway, unless everybody's uh, finished saying what they've got to say about that, have they? Because we go, should get onto this video and start going through it. Yeah, we're going too slow, really. Yeah. 
There was a super chat, by the way, if you want to read that. I'll, I forgot about it. Oh, yeah. No, go read the super chat out. I have to read one thing, though. This is from Google. Okay. A, jelly, a jellyfish has no ears or eyes or nose and no brain. Uh, so wow. whoever did the uh, super chat <laughs> talking about uh, them being able to see, well, they don't have eyes, bro. So it's wow. not really a... That. It's not really relevant to uh, the discussion we were having. It's amazing they can operate without ears, though, when they know how a brain or anything, and they know to get a go away from. Uh, I don't know. I suppose. I mean, you know, you could say they're more like a plant. Then I suppose, similar to a plant. Well, back to the drawing but board, more... Emo. Yeah. Oh, so you guys, we're going to continue now. Yep. Boom. Few, or perhaps even a single precursor gene. This quote alone blows out of the water this whole concept of, oh, well, you need new information. Because as conventional science has been saying the entire time, new information is very frequently not novel. It's a repetition and change of old information, an adaption on an existing <laughs> structure. What about terrestrial living in tetrapods? Well, I mean, is, I'm going to add this real quick because she, she's talking about gene duplication. That's just, uh, I think, I like Stephen Meyer. She just confirmed our, 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 <laughs> yeah. our. It's what Stephen Meyer, he said it's Sorry, like a. Sorry, go on. Yeah, he, you like Stephen Meyer? Yeah, Stephen Meyer said it's like a photocopy machine. If you just take a bunch of copies of the same page, it's just copying the same information. And there's nothing new. It's just a lot of the same information. That doesn't. There's nothing. There's nothing you can generate out of that yeah. that would force something into like a flageller. It sound, Erica sounded like a, a creationist. Then what she just <laughs> said, it, it, she was confirming our side of the our, our side of the argument. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> Kudos. G-Man loves saying that there's no transitional species, no transitional fossils. I would love to talk about that with him if we get the chance, because here are some good ones right here. Eustonoptron, Pandorichthys, Tiktaalik, we have uh, Acanthostega and um, Ichthyostega. Now what we can see in these fossils, which are separated by geologic time, is a mosaic of traits that's slowly moving in its ratio from being more fish-like, or rather more Sarcopterygian-like, to being more tetrapod-like. This includes the emergence of digits, bones in the forearms, pectoral muscles, for lifting themselves up and, and all sorts of this good stuff, including eyes moving uh, to the tops of the head and indeed lung structures, sometimes combined with gill structures in our more mosaic specimens. What about wing evolution? Well, we got that too. In fact, we see the emergence of, of feathers just being sort of a plumage statement to being full on. Oh, this is, uh, I'm not, I can't, that this is not going down. I'm not letting this one go down. Um, I don't know if people know this, if they've done some research. No. I have citation from actually um, journals that say the echolocation inside the bats, the sonar technology, would take two entirely different evolution cycles. Not one. We're talking about, okay, we know one through Darwinian, but there would have to be like basically two Darwinian processes to account for the, the sonar technology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they're, 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 it's, it's the same with the butterflies and all that. You know, two different, uh, radically, two radically different body plans within the same genome that they go into a chrysalis and all their cells die and liquefy and then, and then turn into another creature. I mean, there's n it literally impossible for evolution to explain that via uh, slow successive changes over millions of years. And, and this idea of fish evolving into land-dwelling amphibian tetrapods, let me yeah. touch on that for a minute that you spoke of. Because uh, I've studied that subject highly extensively and written a very authoritative article on it, if I don't mind saying. These are some of the changes that would be required for fish to evolve into land-dwelling creatures. Transition of the rib cage of the osteotes of the bicipital ribs from amphibians into those of the tuberculum and capitulum in the ribs of land-dwelling creatures to uh, parapotheses and diapotheses in the vertebrae. 
not going to happen. Transition of the barrel-shaped rib cage of ichthyostegids to that of the congested and heavily overlapping nature, not going to happen. Migrating of the shoulder girdle of the osteotites to the ichthyostegids, not going to happen. Increasing the rigidity of the spine and ribs from fish from fish to ichthyostega, then greater laxial laxio, uh, uh, lateral flexion of the ribs and the spines of reptiles, that's not going to happen. Transition of the lobe fins into limbs and digits, not going to happen. Grand gradual disappearance of ray fins, not likely to happen. Disappearance of gills and appearance of lungs, not going to happen. Rearrangement of caudal and sacral vertebrae, not going to happen. Transition of ashtray shaped vertebrae uh, to hockey puck shaped vertebrae, that's not going to happen. See, land dwelling creatures have a hockey puck shaped vertebrae. They're like a conve concave lens on both sides. If you're looking at the side of a vertebrae, it's curved inward on both sides. Uh, 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 fish have uh, uh, have an ashtray shaped. That's a very different shaped vertebrae. You have to change. Uh, 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 those things have to change. On top of that, uh, fish don't have bicipital ribs. Land-dwelling creatures do. These bony flanges on the, that run down the spine of fish in order to create bicipital ribs in land-dwelling creatures would have to migrate their, from their location from, to be from bony flanges and then turn into what are called tuberculum and capitulum in the ribs of a land-dwelling creature. The, the odds that that could happen by random genetic mutation is, is absurdity. And the idea that, that lungs are going to develop from gills, we've heard this story so many times, it, 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 it's, it's completely absurd. Besides that, uh, they, evolutionists completely ignore that post-brachial laminae and, and gill arches exist in some of the creatures that are alleged that are already preceded the uh, creatures that they believe that the evolution the fish evolved into. For example, uh, salamanders and uh, creatures like Acanthostega, which is really nothing more than a giant salamander. They're taking a picture of a creature, they're clawing in a transition to land dwelling creatures from fish. But if you look at it anatomically, it's nothing but a giant salamander. So the evolutionists dig a giant salamander fossil out of the earth, and because it's a little bit different from the ones that exist today, they declare it to be a transitional form to land from uh, uh, fish. Excuse me, they've got giant salamanders still in, in, in China, in the largest river in China. They've, they've got giant salamanders that can and, get up to one, two hundred pounds or something, don't they? And, and, and Japan as well. There's Japanese giant giant salamanders and Chinese giant salamanders. I don't think they get 200 pounds, probably 25 to 50 pounds or more. Oh, okay. But, That's massive. But, but uh, it, this idea is, is just completely, you'd have to change, in other words, virtually everything about the organism, everything for a fish to become a land-dwelling creature. Now, about uh, Tiktaalik rosia, Tiktaalik is now no more a transitional form than any other lobe finned fish. It's a lobe finned fish almost identical to some species that exist today. The biggest difference is how far apart the eyes are. And and on top of that, Tiktaalik's shoulder girdle is dermal, not endochrondal. In other words, it's not attached to its spine with, with cartilage and, and tendons, like in yours and mine, or that of a lizard. Okay. So it's just a free-floating. A lobe fin fishes have free-floating bones. There's They don't attach to the spine. It's just the bones stuck in muscle. And gristle. That's all it is. And it flips around because muscles pull on it this way or that. But the bones don't actually attach like your shoulders do with cartilage to your chest or your ribcage in a human being or in a lizard or something like that or in ichthyostega. They're just free floating bones in muscle. So it couldn't have bear its weight on land any better than any other fish. See, it has a dermal, not endochrondal. In other words, it doesn't lock up with the ends or lock together onto the spine like uh, uh, land-dwelling uh, creatures are because that's a setup that allows for the organism to bear its own weight and walk, you see, because it's attached to its spine, right? The limbs are attached to the spine. But not so in Tiktaalik. Its, its limbs are just free-floating in muscle like any other little fin fish. So the truth is the creature couldn't be a transitional form on this alone because it doesn't have a weight-bearing shoulder girdle. So it can't be considered transitional. If it were transitional, we should see the shoulder girdle transitioning from dermal into endochrondal in the animal. But it's just not there. No, yeah. no, if, if what about it, the, just quickly, could we read, oh, sorry, could we read the super chat? 
Yeah, hold on. Someone got go that. We, so we should do that because. Yeah. Actually, actually well, he finds that because the fact. Yeah. No. Stuff, uh, you're saying there, Neff, because you just demolished um, that slide on transitional. So is is it safe to say then that you know her claim tetrapod traits? That are so you know supposedly exist existent in, in TikTok are just consistent with many living and extinct lobe fin fish species we see today. Exactly, it's nothing more than a lobe. TikTok is nothing more than a lobe fin fish. It doesn't show any transitional features. The only feature about the organism that they they really could show that they, and this is very questionable, uh, that could be considered transitional is that they believe that its head may have greater uh, 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 lateral Lexia, uh, flexion. In other words, it could it could f flip its head further to the left or to the right, as though it's beginning to evolve a neck. You know, right? Please with that. I mean, <laughs> it, it's a fish for crying out loud. And, 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 <laughs> and, 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 and not to mention, as you know, Neff, you've talked about it before. The uh, more recent discovery of Poland's tetrapod trackway that actually predates Tiktaalik by nearly twenty million years. So That's obviously, right. based on all the traits that we see, and, and she even said it, you know, mosaics. We see mosaics, we predict mosaics, but mosaics are not the rule. So technically, we've got, you know, uh, tracks of tetrapods that predate Tiktaalik, and we see that Tiktaalik is, is consistent with bottom-dwelling lobe fin fish that we know exist today and ones that, that are extinct. So it's, it's not the so-called missing link from you know fish to tetrapods it's ridiculous no, no it doesn't have, have any of the features necessary to be called a transitional form none i, I want to just dumb down what neff has been saying here for just for a second to put it into like realistic context because everything you said from a scientific perspective i agree with 100 percent. it's a 100 percent valid argument i think what people oftentimes forget about the arguments being made by the evolutionist is that number one Nobody has ever seen these things they are claiming to be uh, transitional fossils, number one. Um, number two, that they completely ignore what we know beyond all doubt is possible from epigenetics and from different breeding aspects. And one of the uh, examples I like to give to people is, okay, if we had never seen a dachshund in a <clears throat> Great Dane or a St. Bernard, and all you saw was the skeleton, would you conclude that they are the same species, are completely separate species, or were transitional forms? Or let's take it even further. What if you saw a Chihuahua skeleton and a Great Dane? Would you think they were related or maybe had some similar ancestry? And those things, you know, we oftentimes in the, you know, they like to argue things from the quote unquote scientific perspective while completely leaving out another massive amount of observed known beyond all doubt all doubt science which could completely negate their argument about transitional fossils that's a great point yeah exactly um, I, and you said something about the neck too right because i found um i'll even post it for people it's a, it's a 21 page paper by um Dr. John Sanford, who, who looks over every single, I mean, it's just as technical and amazing as the one you did, Neff. But he says um, regarding the, <clears throat> the neck, it says, uh, let me see, the fossil itself does not suggest any type of neck constriction. Logically, muscle and other soft tissue would fill the space behind the skull, giving the fish an ordinary fish, sa uh, fish shape being streamlined like any other fish. There is no evidence of a highly rotatable neck. It is true that the bone anchoring the front fins is not fused to the skull, but this by itself does not constitute a functional neck. Uh, one last sentence. Furthermore, this shoulder bone is not linked to the spine in any way, which is what a genuine shoulder bone should do. A distinct neck separating a distinctly mobile head from the rest of the body is a deliberate artistic misrepresentation so you can see the artistic license that's given to them on, on these bones right it's, it's all brainwashing of unfortunately the kids right so this is a terrible uh, disingenuity of evolutionists when it comes to their they uh, they look at a fossil and they imagine what it could do 
and 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 it doesn't even have the features as you pointed out as i said the creature didn't have a uh, endocrondal shoulder girdle it was dermal as you pointed out and this idea that it had uh, greater so much greater lateral flexion in the in the head as though it's evolving in neck it, these are just things that roll around in the imagination of the evolutionists when they look at it and they say oh it, it's got that that's what it's got well show it where's it in the creature well it's not there well it's there trust us yeah right <laughs> well yeah it's just like john said i mean if every single dog breed today went extinct from some flood or something and we dug all the bones up you know a couple thousand years from now you could take like a great dane or a chihuahua or you can take any any number of these dog breed skulls or the bones and you can line up line them up in some type of evolutionary sequence with a couple in the middle as being your transitionals right but Yes, imagination is what it is. Right. It's largely based on shape. When evolutionists see something shaped a little different from something else, and it's a very similar type of organism, they automatically assume there are anatomical differences that correspond to the shape, and that makes evolutionary transition out of it, even if that material didn't uh, didn't fossilize. You know, they, they may not have this a particular type of tissue in the fossil, but then all, all they got to do is fill in with their imagination. Oh, why well, we know what was in there. <laughs> you know. Exactly. All right. So here's the super chat from Caleb. Um, thank you for the super chat, Caleb. Address Erica's claim. We lost fur due to clothing. We I lost have to say how ridiculous that is right off the bat just by saying that now we have a subcontaneous layer of fat. So we lost protective fur to gain a body fat that runs underneath the skin. It just it doesn't line up because think about it just for one second. You're a primate. There was just a split. You have full body hair. Now you decided you need to start wearing clothing. Why? Why do you need a jacket? You have one on. It doesn't make any sense. Now you're wearing this and all of a sudden you start losing body hair. That's a great, that's a great theory. <laughs> yeah, my mom. Apes live in tropical body. environments as well. So why do they need to put clothes on? Uh, evolution has, uh, evolution theory allegedly them, explains the arrival of features, not losing them anyway. So losing doesn't support the theory of evolution. Well, remember, Nat, if you lose it all, you'll gain it all. You just keep losing money, you'll get rich one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, think about it. Think about the natives. Natives are all hairless. They're hairless body everywhere. But the natives are most are the purebreds, right? They're the they're the uh, heirloom variety, you would say. But yet they're the first. So if these are the first people, and they don't have any body hair at all. That's not a very slow progression to losing hair. It's like all of a sudden natives don't have any hair, and then we have some more body hair in other races today. So first of all, people were supposedly from Africa. When you go to Africa, they don't wear much clothing right there's no need it's hot so all of a sudden you think that they're just going to be wearing full jackets and four coats and and all of a sudden now they're going to start losing hair it just doesn't line up <laughs> yeah <laughs> on top of that um the the uh the, the skin of a chimpanzee for example is nearly what and this is true of all apes the skin of an ape is nearly waterproof for example, uh, monkeys in Japan sit around in these uh, hot springs, you know, you've seen the pictures, right? and they, they can sit in there for an hour, two, three hours, get out, and their skin isn't wrinkled. But a human yeah. being sits in one of those things for 15 minutes, you come out, your hands, and your fingers and toes, they're shrivelly because they've absorbed so much water. But not so for an ape. An ape's skin is almost waterproof. That constitutes a difference in the very molecular structure of the cells of the skin of an ape and a human being that evolution could never account for. Well, you can account for everything. There was enough time that went by. Well, yeah, mean, if you had been done. 500 billion years. <laughs> and it's funny you can give them 500 trillion years since our genes yep. are degrading all you're going to see is extinction and it's actually going to make it worse for the evolutionists but well you know this is how evolution we know evolution happened ask just ask an evolutionist how do you know evolution happened well there it is it evolved, didn't it? How else did it get there? <laughs> <laughs> now, Bill and I said that to Ken Ham. I can't remember the exact words but he said uh, he said we're here 
Okay. Oh, I think, um, yeah, Ken Ham asked him, he's like, are, are we related to banana plants? He said, yeah, of course. He said, where's the proof for that? He's like, look, we're here. You and me, we evolved. But evolution is an an abiogenesis, SFT. (laughs) (laughs) You You were dropping some. Didn't John want to say something? Did you want to say something, John? Uh, Sorry, I'm cracking up over here. Oh, yeah. So uh, the other night, Matt and I were talking about doing a, or I suggested we should do a. a parody video in defense of evolution and Neff, you are get you are the leading character with that voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Neff, I seen some of your older videos where you were doing like a game show on like, uh, can you guess that evidence or something? And you had the funny game show. Yeah, oh, is like, is it evolution? I called it. Yeah, yeah, is it evolution? Hey, can yeah. you give us um, like an? Oh, that was too funny. Um, can you give us a snippet of that? <laughs> <laughs> of who? Of the, the show host? The, the show host? Yeah, the show host. <laughs> All right, this is Josie Schmalzy, and we're going to do an evolution. Is it evolution? <laughs> <laughs> and then didn't you have like Richard Dawkins and. Yes, um, of course. Richard Dawkins was in there. But of course, it evolved. But uh, there it is. And uh, that's how we know it evolved, because there it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, Richard Dawkins, he looks at the Lenski experiment, the, the uh, generations and generations of bacteria becoming more degenerate bacteria. There's proof that bacteria turned into a whale. Yeah, mm. yeah not to mention all the, the, the transitionals. They've still got... In some museums, the, the museums they've still got Amblycetus with flippers and fins, and up on the drawing at the front of the museums, and and in some school textbooks they've still got that stuff too. I mean, they're changing it, but they just don't seem to care. Come on, guys, look. I mean, everybody knows it's utterly, completely logical that a dog-like creature became an organism swimming in the ocean and gained forty tons. I mean, in 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 ten million years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, have, right it, it have its testicles of- inside its body when uh, when it has them on the outside. How does that even work? How is that possible? Did it like morph inside somehow? They get like puffed in there? The whale testy? Right. Yeah. Well, it's like we were talking about the other night on Evolution Beatdown Night. Like the amount of novel changes that would need to occur to take your dog like mammal into, you know, something. Something the size of a blue whale is unimaginable. And then even Absolutely. according to the evolutionist time scale, it's only a few million years. Like, give me a break. That's crazy. What the thing gain a ton every thousand years? <laughs> especially when it takes, I mean, you know, especially five, when it takes 97. 100 pounds every thousand years, right? And how they, they does it gain weight like Bigger that. and bigger and bigger. Well, it's got to grow a lot of muscle tissues, that's for sure. McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, it'll do it. Yeah, some big shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right, let's let, um, let, let's keep going to some more of the videos. Uh, We're having like too much fun here. Yeah. <laughs> and Archaeopteryx change their geologic <laughs> time. I, I don't think if you yeah, ran into any idea. of these earlier guys towards the left of the screen in person that you would think they were anything but a dinosaur, but the fact of the matter is you would be right because birds... I mean, what I find it disingenuous, though, they, she has the Archaeopteryx, and she's actually labeling, labeling that as an intermediate. Even science journals are saying that's a hoax. That's been debunked. I mean, I, I just, I'm so sick of this Archaeopteryx thing. I mean, have you guys have you guys done research on that? Or yeah, the evolutionist scientists themselves say now that uh, uh, the Archaeopteryx was not a transitional bird to birds. And Alan Fiducia, the world's greatest ornithologist, has has said it, it, it's just a perching bird. It's nothing transitional about it. And then they'll, you know, they'll call you out on that. I've seen R.J. Downard. Or, oh, well, yeah, Fiducia. Have you read any of Fiducia's, t- t-, you know? And, and then they'll try and downplay um, Fiducia because he's actually a, a, a secular evolutionist that calls Archaeopteryx um, nothing more than, you know, a perching bird. But, you know, they can't have that. So now, now they got to try and discredit him. They've got feathers that are like 150 million years older than Archaeopteryx. And and also, there was that article that you and I read, Matt. I think you found it, um, didn't you? The, the, the one where they said they found, in Australia, um, they found a, 
a dinosaur fossil in the ground with what was obviously flight feathers, like not proto feathers or anything like that, which is obviously fully formed flight for feathers. And I was found in near the Arctic or something, you know, really cold place. And their explanation for it was that the dinosaur needed the feathers, this large reptile needed the feathers to survive the months of darkness that it would have to endure. I mean, and, and, and also, also not to mention they found bird skeletons with the bird fossils with the dinosaurs in the same, it's like you just found a dinosaur with birds and there's bird feathers everywhere with with bird fossils as well as the dinosaur and you're claiming and you say in the same same paper or article that 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 the feathers didn't come from the birds they actually came from the dinosaurs it's just it, it's it's like it does my head in Badly. I mean, we have like Science Magazine, uh, Nature Magazine saying this is a fake. I mean, this is not a real transitional intermediate. So, I mean, what else do you freaking need anymore? I don't know. So keep on going. Dinosaurs. They're yep. theropods. Consciousness. Now, this is one I really like because I, as Jimin probably knows, I study primates or I'm in the process of studying primates. The theory of mind and language are both tied very tightly to consciousness. And here is just a series of various papers. Are those fighting words for Rob, Matt? <laughs> hey, oh, no, that. that's John. That's John's field. That's why we want, that's why we got Johnny to talk about the consciousness. And, yeah, and, and then yeah, the apes. But I, I swear that Raw Matt had some stuff too about teaching. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. I'm all about language. Yeah, language. Yeah, he's language, language. and John's right. the consciousness side. So I want to hear John's take on the what she's talking about. She's saying about consciousness. Go ahead and play it. Let's hear what she's going to say. Yeah, I had to read this semester regarding uh, primates and their their very, very likely theory of mind, the emergence of language and its very proto form in animals as basal as geladas, as well as sort of a theory of mind that we see in cetaceans, in corvids, and in cephalopods. So, you know, oh, very language. interesting stuff. We can see at the bottom one, that's a great paper. Gestural repertoire of one to two year old children mimics what we see in chimps, which is very interesting. In G-Man, short, what the design hell is are not you talking about? Right. You just she's can't come in and do she's saying the basal animals have the basal animals as low as those animals that she mentions have language right. or the beginnings of language. Fuck me oh. out of your mind. She's never taken a linguistics course in her life to say that animals have language. They have basic communication at best. I mean, you tell your yeah. dog to sit and you can come here and follow and eat and it knows basic nouns. The same as a primate. That's all they can do. The primate has the ability to hand gesture some of them back. That's not language. No, yeah, there's no anything grammar. over two nouns is too much for a dog. Yeah, they don't have any grammar. You know, you got to have grammar to have language, right? Two syllables, I mean. And, and then, Matt, your video on linguistics and, um, you know, language pretty well being impossible to evolve. I mean, clearly she hasn't watched that video, right? Oh, I saw that. That was impressive. Yeah, there's no way she watched that. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, there's, she's not going to say that animals have language after watching that video. There's no way. We, you know, some some I find very interesting about the. I mean, Erica did it. Pretty much every atheist that I've uh, debate that I've watched, they are all one hundred percent dependent on deterministic chemistry, also accounting for consciousness and duality not even being a factor to consider in their mind. Because right. I think I think we all know that the second duality it becomes unavoidable, then the only logical conclusion is a designer because of all the different factors required for it to happen in the first place. And beyond that, the differentiation between us and every other life form takes on an entirely different context. The second consciousness and not just awareness, but uh, intelligent consciousness it takes on it becomes an entirely different paradigm to uh, consider and Matt, as you're talking about with linguistics you know yeah you make some noises and some general grunts okay fine but that does not and neff this is one of your favorite uh, components in the context of dna 
you know, you start talking about syntax, semantics, pragmatics. I mean, that's a anybody that anybody that thinks that those components can actually come into existence and have arbitrary meanings applied to them without an intelligence existing prior to is uh, in, in any other context, save our existence in the mind of the atheist, you would never consider that those things would be possible without an intelligent agent being required. And yet it is completely ignored, swept under the rug and aggressively argued against in the context of uh, how we're here. And then, you know, every other, I, I think all of the other uh, branches of their arguments become the fruit of a poison tree. The second you refuse to consider uh, why that component is so important to the overall argument. Exactly. They have to uh, ignore and then deny when, when pressed, uh, yeah. a, a tremendous amount of things that have been discovered. Uh, here's here's an argument, uh, uh, one point about consciousness and, and sentience. Um, human beings have forward thinking. That is, we think about things in the future. We actually design plans for future activities with inbuilt contingencies. Like, I plan on, you know, doing this and the other, but if such and such arises, then I'm going to change what I'm doing. Instead, I'll do this other thing. Then I'll proceed to step C, and I'll go on. See, human beings do this kind of thing. There's no rationale in believing that molecules can do this matter, no matter how complexly you arrange it or how much you have, that it's able to consider the future and make plans about the future. If a brain is chemistry, how is it plausible to believe that the chemistry in your brain can think about the tree in the backyard unless you cut your skull cap off, walk over the tree, and smash your brain against the tree? So it can be in physical contact. The chemistry within your brain can be in contact with the tree. How is it that you have aboutness, that you can consider things external to and not in contact with the chemistry in your brain if your thoughts and feelings are nothing but chemistry in your brain? See, it's not even logical. There's absolutely nothing logical about believing that intelligence or sentience because arises because of chemistry. There's so much more that can be said about it, but it's just absolutely irrational. Irrational. Why they're so desperate for to remove free will from the conversation. Because the second free will comes back into the discussion everything you just said becomes extraordinarily relevant to exactly. uh, the root of everything that we're talking about tonight. Right. And they have to believe that they actually have no free will. I've debated many atheists in, 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 in uh, chat programs that say, I don't have free will. I'm, I'm just a chemical determinist thing. And I'm thinking, really, you didn't decide what pants to wear when you got up, huh? It, it was just <laughs> chemistry, right? <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous what these people believe. Uh, but hey, now, that's why, but now that's why humans it. started wearing clothes after we split from the age. <laughs> but now think about it. It's self-refuting because if they don't have free will, then everything that an evolutionist says about what they believe to be true is nothing more than chemical reactions. It can't be considered true or false. They're only saying it because the cosmic pool break made them say it. That unfathomable chain of prior material causes caused every word or thought that they have. They're not stating something that's their opinion, if they're stating anything. They're only saying things. They're only making sounds, words, come out of their mouth because the cosmic pool break cause them to do it. So they're not actually making an argument. So the truth is, every time an atheist uh, or an evolutionist makes an argument for anything that they say they believe, uh, you can easily dismiss everything they say immediately. Well, what you say can't be true. And if they say, why not? Because you believe in you're, you're just a bag of chemistry and all your thoughts and emotions is just chemistry. It's an unfathomable determinist chain of, of prior material causes that caused you to say that. You're not making an argument about anything. There's a bag of matter on the other end of this phone that's talk, making noise, but you're not saying anything. <laughs> and then, Matt, weren't you weren't you refuting Erica, R.J. Downard, and Dapper Dino last night on these exact topics on uh, you know the origin of consciousness and all this um, in in the after show? I remember watching that. In, in, in uh, I don't recall <laughs> whether I did or not. Yeah, you did. You did. It was good. I'd recommend people watch that. Just kind of goes to show that they don't have any real arguments for it. No, nothing. It, it, it's self refuting.
Uh, we got Crazy. a super chat yeah. from Ashley. Thanks, Ashley. That was awesome. Ten dollars with the hippopotamus in a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Hippopotamus and banana plants are related, according to the evolutionists. So that should get them excited. <laughs> yeah, don't don't diss your cousins, guys. That's your relative. <laughs> You want to go to the next slide yeah, there, please? There go. Yeah. Necessary. Every appeal to intelligent design can, and for the most part has been shown, to be a likely product of evolution by natural selection. No organism or mechanism found in nature can be evaluated as impossible to have occurred thanks to evolution because impossible necessitates preclusion. This means you, you essentially have to say, well, there's no way it could have happened, and I don't think that has ever been done. Additionally, thanks in part to the Wedge document, we now know that modern intelligent design is unapologetically an attempt to offer an alternative to evolution, which requires religion, not evolution. It's an alternative that does require religion. So, other flaws for intelligent design. Well, from a YAC perspective, it cannot de denote its own created kinds. It also has to grapple with the overwhelming evidence of an ancient Earth and universe from geology and physics. Intelligent design cannot clarify what makes a design a design. There's no way to tell what is or what isn't a part of design or an emergence from a created kind. And most importantly, intelligent design lacks any semblance of a model or testable predictions and relies almost entirely on attempting to poke holes in evolution. As such, it has an abysmal literature base. Like it's very difficult <laughs> to find anybody, uh, anybody serious talking about intelligent design, except for maybe Stephen Meyer and Michael Behe. What about evolutionary theory? Well, common descent or an evolutionary theory is supported by geology. I want to know what I mistakes just... these are, though. What? My... <laughs> <laughs> I saw a lot of as Matt pointed out in the side chat, a lot of claims and and a lot of statements. And even on the testable <laughs> prediction side, I mean, we've given the evolution. We've given Erica numerous testable predictions. That's why when they're given answers or they're given refutations, they'll still recycle those same arguments and those same claims. Okay, I got. I got to make a quick. Uh snarky comments and i actually do like her because she seems like a very nice girl but uh that line of thought that she just went on i think she's going to turn into the female version of rj downard when she gets older <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we, were th we were thinking um what's that what's that that guy that just that that passed away recently Ludlow, Bill Ludlow. Ludlow, Ludlow yeah, there she's <laughs> oh, going to be coming another Bill, Bill Ludlow, except she'll be more educated than Bill. I, I want to point out that, um, that her statement that intelligent design, uh, you know, it can't be supported. Uh, the, the, the creationists can't uh, even explain what it means for something to be intelligently designed. That's completely false. Ask any engineer. Uh, what what is what are the hallmarks of design? Well. A couple of them are uh, complexity, uh, uh, order, uh, which which yields complexity, uh, intentionality, and function, which has purpose. Those are the, the criteria for design, and that's what every everybody employs when they observe things. So she's being completely dishonest, even with herself here, because she employs those very criteria when she observes something and determine whether or not it's designed in the same way a creationist does. This is just a, a absolute denialism on the part of the evolutionist that there's there's nothing that we can look at. The, it, it's in so many words, she's saying, we, we can't discern that anything is designed, which is completely ridiculous. How do you know something is designed? Well, if it's ordered in such a way that it yields complexity, and if it has in, in, intentionality imp, implies function and purpose. So things that are designed have purpose. They're designed with a purpose. They have function of some type, some type of function. And there's intentionality behind that because it was designed with a purpose in mind. And also whatever it's comprised of is ordered in such a way that it yields complexity, and when it comes to biological life, the complexity is just mind-bending levels of complexity. So when we look at things, uh, I've said it many times, an evolutionist would look at a giant pile of dirt in the middle of a big grassy field and say, well, it's obvious somebody dumped that dirt there. It didn't just collect by the wind. Somebody with a front-end loader or a pickup truck with a shovel dumped that big pile of dirt in the middle of that grassy field. But then they'll look at amazingly complex, <laughs> specified things I love that in a cell, and they'll say, there's no reason to believe that's designed. I mean, you gotta be <laughs> yeah. kidding me. Even, 
Creed. It sounds like she's parroting a narrative, like from True. Have you guys heard of TrueOrigins.com or org? Uh, it's like an anti-creationist site that for the last couple of years, it seems like she's just regurgitating the same arguments from there. That pile of dirt arguments, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful one, or a compost heap. They'll see a pile of dirt or a compost heap and they'll say, oh, look, that's that's designed. Somebody put that there, but you know, they'll see something as complex as a human being or an elephant or something and they'll say, oh, that's just an accident. Exactly. It's absolutely <laughs> preposterous. <laughs> It's proposed. Yeah, that's the, that's well, the I, best analogy. I, I think something that we have to really contemplate too. This is supposed to be from a the, the how ludicrous their arguments are, but also I think a way to kind of frame ours is you know very often you know the, the going back to deterministic chemistry and just natural processes. We hear that over and over, right? But what they seem to forget is that every and this applies to the d design argument literally everything that has ever been designed by humans uses natural chemical processes as an outcome. But the complexity with purpose that Nev was talking about is what is enables the technological functions to occur. And we just forget about that. And they obviously forget about it. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, if you put paint on your car, there was a chemical process that occurred, but your car didn't paint itself. And as Neff was saying, the, the dirt didn't dump itself. And, it, and you can extrapolate that all the way. But I think very often we, we forget about just the, com yeah, you know, T-Jump and a lot of them used to let us say things like, oh, you're just arguing from incredulity. It's like, you know what? Yes, I am. Because I think that what you're saying is completely incredulous <laughs> yeah. and exactly. lacking in intelligence to conclude that things that in any other context you would look at me like I was a moron for making the argument that, you know, my cell phone came in, just popped into existence because it's natural chemical processes that created the plastic. And right. we, it was, you know, rare earth metals and everything else. You can you go down that rabbit hole. And, <laughs> but, that, but that does not apply to life. To me, that is just a, you've turned off rational thoughts to come to that conclusion. Exactly. You can prove that every evolutionist in the world is a denialist this way. Create a slideshow, right? They, they, they click on an image and they choose designed or not designed. Every time they choose, it moves to the next picture, right? And you have this long slideshow and you have things like a Lego model put together by a three-year-old and they'd say, click, well, that's designed. And then, you know, a bile of dirt in a, in a, in a grassy field, oh, that's designed. You know, a, a car engine part design and you could do this for all kinds of things some very very simple things and they'd say they're designed and very complex things and you could put in things like an, a leg of a roach you could put in a, a, a roach you could put in a spider you could put in a jellyfish you could put in a, an eye a, a fish's eyeball you can anything biological and the evolutionists every time they pick designed they're going to choose not designed for everything biological every single time and that just demonstrates the absurdity of what they say, because those biological things are orders of magnitude more complex than anything man has ever made or will ever make. And and they're going to choose not designed for every single example that's biological, no matter what it is. And that just proves that it's a, it's a mindset for them. The, the complexity of those things is vastly more, more than anything man makes. But if it's biological, they're going to choose not designed every single time. Bingo. So I'm going to keep on playing. Here we go. Biology, paleontology, genetics, uh, morphology, and statistics is by far and away the most parsimonious answer to the question of biodiversity. So let's zip through some of this. Genetics. Humans and chimpanzees, when we compare coding base pairs, are about 99% similar. And you guys are going to see a lot of these slides that if you follow my debates at all that you've seen before because I, I have to bring them up again. We have three papers at the bottom left that, that you know, support this. In fact, humans are more closely related to the chimps and bonobos than any other animal, and they are more closely related to us than any other animal. This is important. That means a chimpanzee has more in common with you genetically and with me genetically than they do with a gorilla. And of course, you, we determine that with the same method, sort of a souped up version, albeit, that we used to determine paternity in humans. Um, that's relatedness. So where do we draw the line? That's the classic question. Here are a couple of great papers on uh, endogenous retroviruses, which are the invasive really there, so necessitate being passed down from... Draw the I, line. I find it, I find it funny with those trees she had at the bottom there. 
um, how she thinks it's just a perfect, I mean, obviously we do see, um, you know, these nested hierarchical patterns in, in uh, genetics and anatomy and things, but the thing is they do have problems as well. Like that, that's why they have to invoke loss of trait evolution, convergent evolution, um, and also their problem of incomplete lineage sorting. So if you look at her trees there, well, the thing is you can look at different DNA sequences and uh, depending on which one you're looking at, they can all produce completely different uh, paths of evolutionary descent, which means um, these analyses can be contradictory to each other. The trees can be totally different depending on what gene you're looking at. So she's making it out to be like it's this perfect uh, gradient, this this perfect you know tree of life, when in fact it's not. There's a lot of cherry picking, uh, you know, going into the, the, those analyses. Yeah, we've already covered the ERV thing. Out of 97,000 ERVs, there's only 14 that match between chimps and humans. And now the evolutionists themselves have discovered that these ERVs, these 14 that match, they do move around. So they may not match in 10 years or 100 years or, or whatever it is. So the fact that these, these ERVs move around, it's just it's crazy. I mean, in, 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 in 20 years or 100 years from now, there might be a whole completely different set of ERV somewhere else that match it's not evidence of evolution at all actually the ERVs is an example of her being refuted on a very specific uh, and, and like John said earlier I mean I, I like Erica she is nice and respectful to talk to but she is already falling into the problem of using already debunked um, arguments I mean we spent a great deal of time in, in my second debate with her talking about the endogenous retroviruses and um, but I, I find it funny that they think it's a big surprise that you know, we find more similarities in anatomy, morphology, uh, more similarities in, in genetics with, say, a chimp or a gorilla or, you know, a, a lemur or something like that than we do with a fish or the bacteria. I mean, it's, it's obvious. We don't even have to look at design modes of transportation to make our argument. It's just obvious. You know, we share so much more with a chimp because, of course, we look a lot uh, more like them and therefore the blueprint's going to be a lot more similar. So if we have more similar ERVs with a chimp than we do with a dog, well, that's not really a big surprise. But like she said earlier, intelligent design doesn't make predictions. Well, we've been making predictions. Dr. Jonathan Wells made predictions years ago. We've always predicted that the vast majority of our DNA, DNA elements, DNA sequences are, are functional uh, in, in some way and serve some type of purpose. And guess what? So obviously the pattern and distribution of these endogenous retroviruses is agnostic. We'd expect this, but now we find that the ERVs are playing incredibly important roles in, in our genetics. And then Erica, like all evolutionists, they'll resort to co-option. You know, oh, they've, they've been co-opted through, uh, you know, the evolutionary uh, process. But it's funny because you'll ask them for an example of a, a non-functional endogenous retrovirus going from non-functional to functional. Uh, something extremely functional in uh, like the placenta, for example, or determining cell types. And I'm sure we can all, all go on and on and on about the, the functions in these ERVs. Um, and, and, and they won't be able to provide that. So it's just all uh, ad hoc, post hoc coming from them to explain why they are so uh, functional. And this has all been explained to her, but I'm guessing she'll still, um, you know, she's probably hoping that she can use this on G-Man and then G-Man won't address it. And then if she goes up against Naf or Jason or any of us, and we point out how functional these uh, all these classes of retro transposons are, you know, he'd be, she just won't accept uh, correction, unfortunately. Um, won't go up against me because my memory's terrible. I'll, I'll, I'll leave all the debating to you guys. Thank you very much. I'll, 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 I'll prefer I prefer to stay behind the scenes as much as possible. <laughs> A little and bit. And just come on to the chats. Yeah. Quick. Uh, Sorry, Matt. Oh, John, a quick, sorry. A, a quick assertion about the uh, or insertion about the uh, retrotransposons. The uh, some I hadn't I'd read about before, but hadn't really considered uh, until the other day. I was actually reading through some stuff on it, and they actually jump uh, in RNA form, and they actually uh, are transported by uh, protein uh, motor but that's a whole other part of the conversation, but they are actually transferred in RNA form 
when they reach the appropriate spot, oftentimes in other chromosomes, they are retranslated re back into DNA prior to insertion oh, into, into the new spot. Whoa. And when I read that, it, I don't know. I, I know I'd read Whoa. that before, but I had not thought about that of just like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait yeah. just a second here. Reverse translation and then insertion in a specific position. And well. something else they're discovering is that uh, based on the gene regulatory network components that might be in proximity of the new location, the outcome of the gene is often varied from the same one in a different position, which I thought was very fascinating. Um, so I also, correct me if you guys think I'm wrong, but that also completely eviscerates a whole, basically the majority of the evolutionary argument uh, from the equation. And, uh, but like I said, that whole like retranslation portion, I thought that was very interesting. I'd love to hear what you guys think about that. Well, I think, I think it's fascinating. And I, I think it's, um, it, it's sad that the evolutionists can't just sit back and ask themselves if these so-called retro transposons or the endogenous retroviruses, if they really are, uh, the leftover remnants of, of viral infections, um, as they propose, or, you know, are they created units of DNA function? Cause based on everything you just described, John, based on everything we're all describing on, on the important functional roles in these classes of retro transposons, the evidence does suggest that they are indeed created units of DNA function, function with a purpose, which is evidence for, you know, intelligent design. And it's also um, all this information that we're gathering and discovering here is based on direct predictions coming from int intelligent design advocates, as well as um, creation scientists. They're all excellent points. In fact, the DNA error correction process, they, they don't like calling it error correction anymore. They, For the last 25 years or more, they've been calling it DNA repair because error correction implies the genome was right in the beginning and its mutations actually cause damage that needs repair. So they've renamed DNA repair. They've called it now, they call it DNA. I mean, DNA repair mechanism, they call it, um, uh, uh, wait, I got confused. They call it uh, DNA. Uh, repair instead of error correction. If evolution were true, then evolution would have gathered as much mutation unto itself as it could possibly get its hands on. It would never design a system to maintain the integrity of DNA against mutation. So the very existence of a DNA repair mechanism refutes evolution because it's like evolution is incorporating mutation is the stuff of evolution, but at the same time, somehow it's going to design a system to protect the DNA against mutation. <laughs> it, 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 it's just amazing. It, it, well, it, in, in line with that, one of the things that just drives me up the wall at the level of ignorance required to make this argument is that what you're talking about, DNA repair, error correction, copy paste, the different functions that exist in biology are often framed by the atheists and the evolutionists as being like just so bad, like no designer would ever create something with this kind of error action yeah. and it's like well if you actually look at the math the error rate is incredibly small but beyond that i honestly dare you to take your computer anywhere yeah <laughs> dunk it in water and start trying to copy things yeah. uh it's not going to work take the shield off of your hard drive sit it out in the sun see what happens place a magnet next to it See if you, without a shield, and see if it doesn't just erase all the data, let alone has the ability to function. Right. And when you, th to me, when you actually think about the incredible plethora of environments that we place our bodies in throughout the course of our lives, temperature extremes, radiation, I mean, just... It, the list goes on and on. The, the, just the physical... Like, think about when we play a game of basketball or football, the level yeah. of force. If you try to smash... <laughs> do hard drives together, you'd lose all the data if you did it at that uh, level of force, right? And somehow our bodies continue to function, copy, and move on with extraordinarily low uh, data errors. And yeah. yet the evolutionists argue that if any one of them happens, therefore, uh, that means there couldn't have possibly been a designer versus the fact that there is so few means that they're probably 
is one or is a reasonable argument in 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 favor of uh, intelligent design. Absolutely, it's it's complete hypocrisy, and uh, insert, copy, and paste processes exist in DNA, and if those aren't designed, what are you going to get when something inserts, copy, or pastes uh, chunks of of of, of uh, information randomly or somewhere around in the genome, you're going to get a computer program that crashes fast. <laughs> exactly. If it's not designed for doing this, it's going to crash. Right? Well, and, and something else I, I read very recently, uh, they've been discovering, and you may know, be able to expound this more enough, the many of the copy, or it's quote unquote duplicate genes, right? Um, their location that's, you know, supposedly sporadically, you know, inserted throughout the genome. Uh, they've actually been discovering in error correction what's actually happening is the proteins are going to that duplicate gene cutting out the piece making the copy and then bringing it back to the damaged gene and the location of that duplicate gene is actually a uh, geographic proximity to some of the most expressed genes and i thought that was very interesting of like huh well that's cool You've got backup parts that oh, yeah. have been installed very close. You've got redundancies and uh, uh, you know, error correction built in both from a data perspective as well as an efficient application of uh, that backup file. That's exactly right. There is redundancy in the genome, and uh, it's been understood for at least 15 or 20 years now that if a, a particular gene gets damaged, uh, and it's a it's a very important one, and pretty much I guess you'd say all genes are important. But uh, it's known that uh, backup copies of that gene alleles of that gene will be turned on, and all things go on as normal. Exactly. And and then I want to ask the evolutionists: if natural selection sees the short term, and yet our genetics are, are full of redundant elements and redundancy in general, backup code, like, like you said, Neff, how did evolution evolve something that's beneficial for the long term? You know what I mean? Like how did, how did evolution evolve a spare tire? <laughs> you know what I mean? Evolutionists would look at a car and a spare tire and say, Oh, look at that junk DNA. No, if you get a flat tire, all of a sudden that spare tire becomes useful, just like the redundancy yeah. in genetics. So how did, how did evolution evolve something like that when it only sees right. short term? I doubt they have an answer. Right, and the complexity of DNA repair mechanisms is mind-bending. Mind I mean, it's just astonishing. You've got various very complex protein complexes that attach to the DNA. So on one on the left side, one on the right side of the the the, the wrong base pair, and then it, they'll snip the DNA and or separate the strands. And then another molecular machine comes and attaches, and it moves forward and backward, and it removes the ba the bad piece. And then another molecular machine comes in, and it replaces the bad with the good. And then the two parts that opened up the DNA for all this to happen, they disassemble and they take off. I mean, this happens in unison. I mean, if that's not designed, I mean, you've got nails in your head. <laughs> well, it's, it's amazing. And okay. I find it amazing that, we, like uh, John, you were talking about, we were talking about the retro transposon. The fact that they can actually jump around the genome and turn on and off various types of genes. And then they find that in these mouse embryos, that uh, there's a certain class of, of retro transposon that if it's actually deactivated, the mouse embryo will not fully develop. Like it'll start developing and then it'll suddenly stop because it's dependent on the function of these uh, specific classes of uh, retro transposons. And yet the evolutionists, and I always ask, why would you, uh, why would you want us to believe that these types of DNA elements were the result of ancient viral infections or like the, the redundancy and things like that, just, you know, based on neutral evolution and suddenly co-opted all these important, um, you know, functional components to our genetics. It's nothing but, um, you know, fairy tale. It's, it's their philosophy that that could happen. Well, and I, I think something else that applies to the design argument in relation to everything that we're talking about right now is the, temporal variations that are accounted for in biological functions and you know as we're talking about you know how do you see the future right well how in the heck is the development process have built in coding functions that alter based on time and like right. literally change the outcome based on the development period I mean, to me, when you really think about that, like, hey, I've got a machine 
and a code base. And this code function is going to change based on temporal factors. And then once we reach a certain point, I'm going to alter the outcome of this existing function to be something, something completely different that has zero relation to the original function, all based on time. And to try and claim that that is purely deterministic, it, to me, is, especially when you factor in that the outcome of the, of the modified version, or the, not modified, the alternate version based on time is completely different. You can't just claim it's a similarity. It's a predetermined uh, downstream, upstream knowledge base that's required in order to have that component. And then when you think about how, to your point, you're making um, SFT in terms of if you don't have these, then development halts. <laughs> well, well, if it can't <laughs> if it can't live, then that's kind of a problem, folks. And you really have to start to think about these uh, these factors. And you can't, in my opinion, you can't just dismiss them as oh, well, it just happened in evolution. Like, okay, well, how did evolution happen if everything died? If they, if these things weren't uh, accounted for, exactly. So it just waited millions and millions of years, apparently, for some of these uh, you know so called junk DNA related elements to enter the genome and eventually co opt the function, and now they can survive past a certain stage in development. Like it's it's unbelievable. It's like Neff always points out. I mean, our genome is multi dimensional. You know, it operates. In, in, in four dimensions, the fourth dimension being time. You know, the gene changes in that fourth dimension and even changes uh, function during those periods of uh, developmental windows. And I always point out that uh, the ENCODE researchers themselves, the project that the evolutionists hate, they demonstrated that over 80% of, of, of the DNA is, of the non-coding DNA at least, is transcribed into RNA suggesting function and yet, and yet they tested almost none of all these different stages and um, you know developmental windows, and we're just beginning to understand the developmental process. I mean, the the coding and non-coding DNA—they're coordinating with each other how to uh, put in place this this fully functional organism. So um, at this point, we can discuss all night, you know, the incredible amount of functional, uh, you know, function in, in the DNA, but yet we, we know so little of the of the developmental process. So at this point, we only understand probably less than one percent of the DNA language. It's it's incredible. Very true. I understand very data. little of it. Hey, praise uh, Jason's stuck behind. Uh, no, no, I'm not anymore. I'm oh. back in. He must have added me back. He must have seen it. He was just busy doing something else. I knew he was busy at the time, and, and I've forgotten what I was going to say anyway. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> Actually, Matt, on that slide, you see where she says that, uh, um, where is it? 99.9% .9 of ERVs in humans. Actually, the StreamYard part's blocking that off. But we discussed that before, where it says this means less than 100 of the 200,000 ERVs in humans are lineage specific. Remember, we were talking about how a lot of them are actually uh, fragments, and there's only like a few actually whole ERVs. Can you touch on that? Yeah, no problem. Ba basically, what happened is if you're looking at the entire uh, genome and you look at all the ERVs, yeah, there are 98,000, but these are bits and pieces. In humans, there's 50 to 60 complete pieces. They're called HERVs. And in chimps, there's only 20 that are completely full bits. The rest of theirs is also broken and fragmented. Now, here's the thing. Um, this is what matters the most. When you look at these 50, 60 complete ones and you look at these in the, in the 20 and the chimp, these are functional DNA elements. They have complete function. The other bits and pieces, they still, a lot of them have function as well, but not complete functions. They don't, they don't know exactly what all of them do. But there is a study that looked at and found that 51,197 are still functional in, in, in the fact that they initiate transcription. Now that's pretty incredible considering they're supposed to be nothing but remnant, broken, worthless, endogenous retrovirus leftovers. So why would they have any type of function at all? Here's another thing. All ERVs have lethal mutations in them, all of them. So what's well. the rescue device for HERVs having function? Because HERVs, remember, these are the fully functional ones. It says, we believe that HERVs play a multifunctional role based purely on a consequence of their abundance in the genome. That's the rescue device. Wow. So, yeah, they have a function, but that's only because there's lots of them. It's bound to happen wow. sometimes. That's so sad.
Right. So yes, there are. We do share fourteen out of those fully functional ERVs, but they're functional. So therefore, are they really what they say they are? Are these really worthless leftover viruses that left a, a coding imprint on something? Because when you remove them, you actually can't even reproduce because these are required elements, even in the placenta. So it's just... Or did the virus come from them? Right. Or are or they viruses they... at all? Are they, are they just something that yeah. looks like a virus? Because guess what? There's things that look like telomere sequences, but they're not telomeres. So why are there telomere sequences in the chromosomes where yeah. there's no telomeres? 91,000, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, uh, uh, Tompkins, uh, did a study of those. Uh, um, was it Tompkins? No. Um, uh, oh, shoot. Well, I've forgotten his name. Um, I think Tompkins and him did, did the study. Uh, but anyway, uh, and found 91,000 of what appear to be telomeres pasted all over throughout the human genome. 91,000. And, and almost none of them are actually telomeres. They just look a lot like a telomere. Right. You know? They're sequences, right? They're just sequences. So it's right. like finding a couple like A, B, C, and D. And we go, well, those are telomere numbers. I guess they're telomeres. Right, but, right. Yeah, kind of a misleading thing, right? So. Well, these are the people that will say a Lego brick was designed, but, I mean, but, a, but a human being was not, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. An egg? That's ridiculous. That wasn't designed. Even though they know a chicken came before the egg now. I don't know what they have to say about that. Do you know chicken eggs have a little space inside the egg that has air? And the amount of air inside the egg is exactly enough to get the little chick to breathe long enough for him to break himself out of the shell. If like, that egg, eggs are designed that way, if they didn't have that little gap inside of the material between the material and the shell that provides air, uh, breathable air for the chick, the chick wouldn't hatch because it wouldn't have anything to breathe while it's trying to break out of the shell. Pure luck. Yeah, just, oh yeah, luck. It's getting really late, guys. Are we going to finish okay. this thing? Or? Are you going to, yeah, are you there, praise, or are you falling asleep? Common <laughs> ancestors and 99.9 .9 of the ERVs oh, we find in humans are shared praise. with those in the chimp genome. <laughs> What about oh, paleontology? Yeah. Wow, I love this picture. I bring it up every time because I think it's so cool. Here we have a ton of different hominid and hominin skulls all lined up in a row. And what we see is small morphologic change over geologic time. It may be hard to imagine B going to C or, or rather not B to C. It might be hard to imagine B going to M, but not quite difficult to imagine B to C. In fact, some anthropologists who are trained have trouble identifying who's who. That's how gradual this change is. Of course, it does require quite a bit of time. And I hope that we will discuss that as well. Here's some excellent uh, sort of uh, in-depth look at the Australopithecines, both Afarensis, Anamensis, and Afarensis, or rather Africanus. So we have almost identical knees in the bottom right. It's important to remember we don't just have one specimen of Australopithecines. We have many. They have a parabolic palate of, of gradually more medial um, ventral foramen and magnums going underneath the skull to support bipedalism. An inline big toe. Look at these pelvises. If you were to pick one that was the odd man out, you'd pick the chimp. What about the femoral head? Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy how, how gradual this is. You couldn't ask for a more perfect mosaic with regard to postcranium. What about morphology? Well, everything that you use to categorize that rhesus macaque as a catarine, you used to put humans in the same category. We have all of the same traits that make them catarines, and that's why we are also classified as catarines. We could go in depth more onto this, but, uh, you know, we, we'd, we'd be here all day if we spent all that time doing it. What about statistics? This is, this is sort of a recent one that I very much like, and I appreciate uh, Jackson Wheat for these sources. I'm going to read sort of these little quotes from these two papers, both of which are very recent. The first one says, we overwhelmingly reject both species and family separate ancestry. Those are the created kinds sort of in a creation orchard that Answers in Genesis proposes due to infinitesimal p-values. Many of these data sets reject species separate ancestry strongly and the probability of obtaining a test statistic more extreme than the one observed under the species separate ancestry model being incredibly small, often approaching or greatly exceeding the probability of picking a correct atom at random among the estimated 10 to the 80th atoms in the known universe. That means that statistically speaking, when we just look at the raw mathematic data, there is no support for separate ancestry. 
Then there's the second one that says, we demonstrate quantitatively that, as predicted by evolutionary theory, sequences of homologous proteins from different species converge as we go further and further back in time. A non-evolutionary model shows no... no pause for one second. A non-evolutionary control model shows no... So I find it entertaining that she's making an argument from uh, probability, uh, given the fact that a single protein evolving or coming to existence by chance is one in 10 to the 164th power. And she's arguing 10 to the 80th in, uh, <laughs> against, uh, speciation. That's exactly right. Yeah, and maybe, point. you know what, what we'll do is we'll go around the room and just give, uh, just so we address everything. We're destroying this video, which is good. Uh, we don't want to skip past, you know, her points on the uh, Australopithecines and Australopithecus afarensis, for example. There's there's so much we can say about that. Um, like, oh, yeah. for example, um, even in 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 Lucy's uh, form in Magnum that that they look, you know, that that she talks about here, it lies in in much the same position as some apes today. So Eric is claiming that, you know, Lucy walked upright, but that's actually misleading. Um, she probably did have a unique walk, but uh, most certainly didn't walk like we do as humans today, especially because um, if, if we were to allow for size differences, let's say with Lucy, and then we were to compare with a gorilla, um, a gorilla in the Australopithecine, and its form and magnum are actually nearly identical. So um, a lot of it is um, kind of just forced and interpretation to make it look. Yeah, go ahead. Your turn, Jason. The orbital plane as well. They have locking. They have locking. They have a, 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 a wrists wrists designed for knuckle walking. Their arms were so long they could have scratched their ankles while they were standing up. They had an opposable <laughs> um, thumb for a big toe. Uh, right. not, not quite as pronounced as, as, as chimpanzees as of today, but, but still an opposable thumb. It, they, it was, it was nothing more than an ape. They have teeth that look similar. There's a thing called a golden baboon or something. I think it is. If you look at its teeth between its two giant canines, the top front teeth, they, they look so human. It's creepy. I mean, we've got animals alive today <laughs> with, with very human looking teeth. Um, and, and like all sorts of, and we got fish. There's types of fish that have very human-looking teeth. It's 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 very creepy when you look at. So I can't remember what sort of fish it was, but I remember looking at the fish's teeth and just going, "Wow, that that looks like it could have been in my mouth," you know. Uh, so That's yeah, your ancestor. It, it, yeah. <laughs> <That's> your ancestor. <laughs> Go ahead. Don't disrespect your ancestor like that. <laughs> yeah. And then Matt and I always talk about the fact that a bamboo was a bamboo bone. I pointed this out in my first debate with Erica. It was incorrectly assigned to Lucy for over 40 years. I mean, so many of these reconstructions are literally done on, you know, fragmentary bones. And then they're done based on evolutionary assumptions. So you got this bamboo bone. So they put together in whichever way they think they want them to be put together. That's that's like what I was saying the other day is when they chip away the, 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 the stone away from a lot of these bones, I, I'm pretty sure in some cases, maybe not in all cases, but in some cases they're using a bit of artistic license like like um, Lovejoy did with the with the Lucy's hip and just leaving a little bit extra here or there exactly. just so it fits in with their evolutionary uh, paradigm. I, I wouldn't put it past them. And then we always point out too that That's like true. originally the Lucy, uh, Lucy herself was found in hundreds of pieces before she was then glued back together. And of course, and they parts of her were far away from from from. They found some parts that were hundreds of meters or kilometers mm -hmm. away or something. Yeah, the knee was found uh, a mile away, two hundred feet deeper inside the earth. And then, and then Erica and, and uh, Bill Ludlow they'll point out like, oh, you know, more bones have been recovered since. I think Lucy was found in what, 1974? But guess what? Finding more bones didn't help them at all because Lucy's species, the Australopithecines, uh, for one, the toes have shown you know, to be curved like, like uh, tree dwelling apes. And uh, Jason pointed a lot of this out as well. Her shoulders have been found to be nearly identical to living great apes today. Her wrists, of course, you touched on that. They are, uh, you know, they at least resemble other knuckle walking ape species. Her hands were similar to, to chimpanzees. Um, and, and you have to, you have to, um, recognize the fact that a lot of these bones, for example, like you've got, uh, was it Mary Leakey, you'll have Johansson, for example, back 
in, in, in the seventies, eighties that were finding these bones, they were competing with each other and they had a lot of disagreements and a big uh, main reason for the disagreement is a lot of the times you'd have a mixture of, uh, you know, human bones and eight bones that, and that's why you see a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of ghost, um, taxa because they're just like a waste basket bin of, of random bones. Like you can see that with Habilis and, and Sediba. Um, so they're just like a mixture of, and, and that's why they look so contradictory in a lot of their, um, uh, in, in their reconstructions because it's just they find a bone they don't know where it belongs they throw it in a basket and then they call it like a different type of species so uh, another so thing that, the entire field another thing that makes uh points out the absurdity of, the, of these ideas of believing that these creatures they find in the earth are 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 these unimaginable ages is if it take a just do a google search or being whatever, and pull up pictures of these uh, hominid fossils, you'll find some of them have skulls with, with actual teeth in place. Look at the teeth. In some cases, they're white and glinty. I mean, now, I don't know about you, but since human beings lose most of their teeth, most of them by the time they're 60, 70 years old, I just don't believe that in the acidic soil of the earth, an organism's teeth are going to have enamel on them. For 2.5 yeah. million years, I don't think. Yeah, <laughs> and not to mention that that knee joint that you were talking about that they found uh, a, a mile away and 200 meters deeper. Well, you know why they had to put that with Lucy? That's a human knee joint. That's probably a human knee joint. Right. But they had to put that with Lucy. They had no choice because if they admitted that that came from a human, then that's gonna you know what that's gonna do to evolution. Yeah, you know. Spe good speaking way. of uh, knee joints. Something I was thinking of in the, I think it was the previous slide, uh, was showing like the uh, different hands and the pelvises and such. The I find it very ironic that that is being used as evidence in favor of evolution while completely glossing over the engineering marvels that are the pelvis, that are the hand all the different components that enable life to exist in the first place. And it's like, oh, well, these are similar to each other. Therefore, they must have came from one another versus, wow, do you even comprehend the complexity of the hand, for example? And uh, I, used, right. I used to have a client, uh, he owned a very large prosthetics company. And I remember looking at some of their technology one time and you know, they are on the cutting edge designing all of this amazing new stuff. And I think at the very, this is about six years ago, and they were not even, I think they said that they were at the, at the time, the best on the planet was only about 45% as capable as a human hand. And, yeah. and that was like the absolute best one out there but still didn't have the reflexology and all the different components that come with it. And yet we're supposed to say that because there's some bones over here that have some similar functional aspects, we should view that as evidence for evolution versus a intelligent designer. Yeah, it's nonsense. And the thing, one of the things that makes me so angry about what the evolutionists do is they make these mock-ups of uh, Australopithecus afarensis and whatnot, and they put them in museums to influence all the kids to come in school buses to look at them. And they got the creature standing upright, walking, and it's got human-looking hands and human feet, and it's standing upright. But the pelvis of Australopithecines would not allow that animal to stand upright for any length of time. Because it's the iliac blades of its pelvis curve or, or flare out to the side and don't curve forward, and their pelvis is too long. It's like a chimpanzee. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, in in some cases, Australopithecines have a shorter pelvis, but the iliac blades of the pelvis are designed for a, a, a creature that walks on all fours. So, but they model the creature standing upright as erect as a human being to influence the minds of the people, especially kids, that come in to see these things and believe evolution. You know, they want to get you while you're young yeah control you from the cradle to the grave 
I read those studies, by the way, those ones that are on that pay, uh, that channel right there that she has linked. The one on the bottom is very, very vague. She basically copied the abstract and then pasted it in there. Because when you go to the study, you can't actually find anything other than the abstract online. I looked everywhere and couldn't find it. And I was wasting time. So I decided to go to the top one. And that actually had a lot of information in it. Basically, in a nutshell, what they did is they invented two ancestral protein sequences and then they tested them to see if they actually converged and they did. And that was enough evidence for them to conclude that evolution is true. But they admit they say this, of course, such an analysis by themselves cannot establish the mechanism for evolutionary change, but it happened. <laughs> yeah. more assumptions well a lot of these papers too like for example jackson wheat uh, herman mays they point out these uh, papers that supposedly um you know refute um limited ancestry and uh, individual trees like that we would believe in the created kinds um but the thing is they don't actually uh test them all for one they test the models assuming that uh, these nested hierarchical patterns because that's what they're looking at right on a uh, sometimes on uh, like for example Herman Mays he looks at um, hierarchical patterns on a, a protein level amino acid level um, but the thing is they're assuming that evolutionary common descent can only explain these patterns when as we've talked about over and over again, we predict the exact same things, but we also don't attribute all the DNA differences as mutations. So they don't do these tests, these evolutionists don't do these tests in these studies and analyses um, from our starting position that uh, we were created with front-loaded uh, DNA differences. And Dr. Nathaniel Jensen points this out. I'd recommend people go read his uh, his paper, his, his rebuttal to Herman Mays on a lot of these same studies. Um, yeah, they start with a basic premise that only they can explain hierarchies. And then they think that they've refuted uh, created kinds, which is not true. I'm just about to post a link to this fish with human looking teeth. And it's, <laughs> yeah, do it. it's, it's really creepy. Praise, uh, I couldn't help but notice that she also posted the shapes of the primates on the upper left-hand picture of that corner that you uh, that you were showing. And yet in your debate, you specifically told her that humans always have a parabolic shape to their jaw. And it can be a Neanderthal, Denisovan, humans, it doesn't matter. We always have the same shaped jaw. And she goes, well, we are apes. <laughs> <laughs> that was her reply. Yeah, it's just begging the question. What? I couldn't believe yeah, it. That is big. And like, oh, we are apes. Okay, I guess we're going back to the debate. You know, why are we apes? Why did we evolve from ape-like ancestors? <laughs> Logical fallacy. Um, here's here's something to consider. Chimpanzees have eight to ten percent more DNA than human beings. Right. For that to for that kind that much genetic material to have been acquired and spread throughout the genome. It would have to been spread all over the place uh, in the amount of time that the evolutionists claim humans and chimps diverge from a common ancestor would, would constitute a mutation load so great that most species would go extinct. They, no, no organism could sustain that much genetic mutation, adding that much material, inserting it randomly throughout the genome. It would kill. It would make the organism go extinct. This is one reason we can know for a fact humans cannot be related to chimpanzees. That's a great point. That's a great. I, I brought that up, too. I think it was my f first debate with her. I mean, yeah, the chimp genome is larger than the human genome. How'd that come about? And just remember, all their best... Um, at least genetic evidence that they used to, that they do point to to prove chimps and humans are related. For example, the pseudogenes, the ERVs, the ALUs that we we talked a great deal about. Um, the patterns, right? The DNA hierarchical patterns, a junk DNA, uh, the so-called chromosome two fusion. All of these individually have been overturned. They've been overturned with the junk DNA paradigm. And then we have all these differentiating uh, lines of evidence like the DNA function, the orphan genes, the DNA barcoding, which we didn't even get into, that actually suggest a limited ancestry. Not to mention our mitochondrial DNA and our Y chromosome go back to a single male ancestor and a single female ancestor that are nothing like a chimpanzee. So <laughs> it's dead in the water. You know, they're done. Rest in peace. 
Rest in pieces. Yeah. Here we go. Last part. Convergence and only a small number of parameters are required to account for the observation. It is time that researchers insisted that doubters put up testable alternatives to evolution, which they have not. Well, what about you weren't there? You know, it's not like we, we saw all this happen, but that and that's true. But there are plenty of fields of science that are not as scrutinized as evolution that do the same thing. In astronomy, we get data from neutron stars and black holes and supernovae, and they inform us of their properties. We're not directly observing them most of the time, or in some cases, none of the time we, we are. <laughs> what about medicine? Well, a pathogen is not always directly cultured, but doctors will still treat it based off of the data or the symptoms. Or geology. We haven't watched the plates move for millions of years, but we know how they move today, and we can use that to predict the formations they were once in. Most creationists accept Pangaea under a Noachian lens, saying that all the plates moved apart into their present condition during Noah's flood. And a shameless plug for R.J. Downard and Jackson Wheat. They have an excellent book that covers in more depth what I've done in this. So what is it with R.J. Downard and this art in uh, Jackson Weed? Are they her authority on this stuff? Oh, that, like uh, RJ, that well, you know that R.J. Downard has a the largest archive of published papers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I think I heard that about six times in my debate with him. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny if you'll ask him specifically. Did you like I was in the chat yesterday? I was like, listen, I I've read in depth all these papers on endogenous retroviruses, the orphan genes, uh, you know, some of the uh, um, DNA barcoding related papers. Have you? And just silence. So he wants to play the source methods game with us. Meanwhile, he's got a whole stash of them. But you know, how many has he read? When's the last time he's, he's read specific ones? She keeps going to R.J. Downard and Jackson Wheat because, um, and like I said, she's she's nice. I enjoyed the debates with her. I debated her again. I was respectful enough. But uh, she does keep getting refuted, and she's going back to the drawing board, and the drawing board is R.J. Downard, Jackson Wheat, because I can see here that she's now incorporating a lot of their arguments. Well, it's something else to consider about just about her actual argument, right? If you weren't there, therefore we should just be able to d deduce the something I get worked up about is when you actually consider the arguments that are being made on, oh, we know it evolved from this because of if we re engineer or hypothetically re engineer what the genetic sequences would have had to have been before and now then we could know what if, if, what uh, mutations took place and i'm like okay uh that's like saying in i wrote a script for a web app that does this function but if i changed these 300 lines of code then it could have a different function well no kidding you're absolutely correct. That could happen. <laughs> right. The, it's but, also begging the question. It's point, like saying, can, can't we, you, it's, it's begging the question. How do we know it evolved? Well, there it is. It, it's the same thing all over again. Well, no, I, I, I agree with you. I, that, that's the outcome of it. But I'm saying from a like right. realistic perspective of what the argument actually is, if you actually, if you really consider what it is, and this is why I push so hard that, yeah, uh, that DNA and genetic code is a code and it is a programming language is because if that is true, then what I just said about, well, cool, I changed 300 lines of code, now my web app does X, is, is literally a comparison to what they are arguing took place in uh, you know, these modifications. And then when you get into things like you know, new body plans, it's like, okay, y'all, yep, sweet. I used the Node.js framework for my web, this new web app. Uh, that does not mean that mine is the same as the other guys who also use the same framework. And we use code libraries and APIs for different elements of the, uh, the end result, but the outcome from the user interface perspective is not even remotely similar, but just now you're going to argue that because I have similar aspects of the code between these two completely different web apps that one came from the other. I mean, you would be laughed out of the room and be considered a complete idiot if you made that argument in any other kind of technology context. And yet, 
and the point ultimate point I'm making is that is exactly the argument that is being made by the evolutionists when you really look at the ultimate root of uh, what has to have occurred for their theories to be true. Yeah, Great point. good Great point. point. So that, I mean that pretty much sums it up. <clears throat> she she put a bunch of straw mans up. Do you guys want to see the straw mans? Uh, what to conclude, or you just want to call it? Mm, it's getting pretty late for me. I'm gonna take off soon. Yeah, it's it's, it's about four a.m. for me. I, I think we did a really thorough, uh, probably so. irrefutable <laughs> rebuttal to <laughs> all of her claims. So hopefully, hopefully, I mean, Jimmy learned audience, some. <laughs> If he's watching, I send him. Uh, I send him this out, this link. So we'll see. Great. Yeah, and, and <laughs> hopefully watched. people in the chat can can pass it around. I think we were really thorough, but probably beyond thorough. If anyone in the chat or something watches this video and then they come up with a or find an argument that they think we didn't address, just uh, let us know in the chat or email, and then we'll address that. But okay, let's go have a bowl of rock soup. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, so I've got a meeting with my bed. We so. have like a special, like we we in um, SFT were talking. You might have a stream on um, slavery and rape in the Old Testament. But my question is the one way in the the chat because he's another guru. He's probably one of the best out there when it comes to citations for ancient Near East stuff. So I'll, I'll ask him if he wanted to join in with that. So I would, would you want to set that up, SFT? Were you thinking of that? I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah, sounds awesome. Yeah, I mean, if you guys want the load down, you'll get, I mean, you guys will get hit with the ocean, like a freaking wave of stuff that debugs cool. slavery. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, thanks for that praise. Yeah, and my, my pleasure. I think it's important to uh, understand the theme of the Old Testament and the culture. It, it all comes important when you exegete these texts. So, I mean, that's important. I'll, we'll bring that up, though, when it comes up. No, I think that's a great yeah. We know the atheist loves bringing up those texts and going yeah. to the Old Testament, taking them out of context. So I think that's an important topic to address and refute as well. Yeah. yeah. They do, and they don't know. They don't understand. <laughs> they just don't, and they they cherry pick just like evolution. It's the same type of stuff. Um, so we'll see. I'll, I'll ask one way through what's going on with that. If not, I'll just do it. I'll take it. On. I'll I'll do it. I got plenty of citations. <laughs> <laughs> the citation. Man. They never. They never give me citations anymore. Anyway, most of them know me now, and, and when they debate me, they will not give me. They don't like giving me a citation because I go through and I pick it apart and I just say, well, you know. But, but, or basically what I say to them when I start to get cranky and, and, and annoyed with the, they just give me one citation out of the 70,000 citations in the literature that shows one fact of evolution, just one. should be easy for you seeing you keep telling me that evolution's a fact, right. and they can't. There's not one. They're all theories and hypotheses. Yeah, well, you're the master, Jason, at tearing those apart. I love it. Yeah, oh, I it's, love it. It's slow. Evolution's really slow. And it takes a lot of time, except when it goes like within a snap of a time. Rapid evolution. So, <laughs> what is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that's speciation, isn't it? It's rapid. Rapid evolution is speciation, and they just they they absorb that out of they they absorb that from us from creationists. Yeah, but they'll well, keep claiming that they never did. It, they yeah, did. they do that all the time. And, you know, evolution theory is really like silly putty. Remember what silly putty was? I don't know if you're old enough. Yep. Yeah, yeah I do. The stretchy plastic cramp. Yeah. So evolution theory is like a big little of egg. silly puppy. They, they can, yeah, you can stretch it any which way and include anything. And so yep. nothing can ever disprove the theory and everything is included. Any scientific discovery, oh, we'll just pull the silly putty over there and wrap it around there. We got that. That's part of our theory now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's like horse. Uh, Nathaniel Jensen went on about horse, um, the horse kind, and the way he described the horse kind was just absolutely mind blowing. I wish I had the, the 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 in front of me right now so I could read it. But the evolutionists say that it took um, I don't know twelve million years or or however many million years for these horses, these the six horse species in nature to arise. But then they say um, there's hundreds of there's literally 
uh, I think there's 300 different um, species that have been bred by artificially bred uh, by by humans, and they say that only took 12,000 years. So humans can make 300 different species in, and if you extrapolate that out to the to the evolutionary time frame, then you'll end up with uh, something like I think. 200 million years right. in evolutionary time to get those 300 different species <laughs> or something well, like that it's such a good point you, you got that three works. species you got three species of zebra uh one wild horse species and three wild asses seven in total and according to the evolutionists that took you know 14 million years or something to uh, <laughs> occur but then we have over 850 breeds of horses and donkeys in the world today and 850 those were, you know, uh, those came about in, in human history, but they're wondering how we got seven species from, you know, some horse kinds off the ark. <laughs> well, we got eight of them breed the horses. The hominids <laughs> were terrible breeders, that's all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, what, what's really one of the, the, the worst problems for evolutionists today is the information revolution. It's, it's widely recognized now by secular mainstream scientists that DNA is a package of information organized linguistically and operates algorithmically. In order to deny this, the evolutionists we debate are, all, are going to continue to deny that it's actually information in DNA, that it's actually linguistics there, and it's actually algorithms because they know that only intelligence creates those things. And so uh, I've been debating evolutionists about this thing in various venues on the internet uh, over the last several months, and it, without fail, every time, they deny, the, the, they'll say, well, it, it, it kind of likens to information, but it's not really information. It's, those aren't really algorithms, uh, algorithmic operations in the cell or in DNA. It just, it, we, we can look at it and we can kind of make it think that it is algorithmic. See, so they're in denial that these are actual properties of DNA. They have to be, because if they are, then it's obvious that it was designed, has to be designed, because nature can't make it. Only intelligence can make those things. And the mainstream scientists, they don't really don't know what to do with it except to write about it, but they don't write how evolution could make that. Funny thing. They'll write that it's there, but they won't tell you how it can come into being. Well, no mechanisms. Well, Neff. Um, in case you missed the memo from T jump, <laughs> the, there is no difference in the information of code or programming or computer or books or anything else. It's just right. like rocks knocking right. into each He's other. He's a joke. <laughs> yeah. I saw him saying that. He's just a joke. That's when he was debating you, wasn't He's it, John? He's a sniffer. When, when he, when he actually said that in the debate, it, it, I, I actually I, I admitted this in a kind of response to somebody that that actually caught me off guard when he uh, compared it to two rocks going together. I'm like, he, uh, what was going through my head? I'm like, are you absolutely kidding me that this is is this actually being made as an argument right now? Yes, from a pure like absolute most dumbed down uh, physics definition yeah. of information. Fine. B rocks but, have information and crystals have information right. therefore it's easy to uh, make a four-dimensional genome right. but, but, but not but not prescriptive information it's a, totally it's a face palm moment face palm for sure yeah and i was like wow and this guy and oh by the way this was i think this is right after he had just told me uh i know quote i know more about more than you about everything and uh that one got me too. I was like, "Well, that's an interesting." Yeah, <laughs> rubbish. Well, the debate's over with you. He wins because. But but that, I, I where I'm going with all that whole thing. I can't resist getting a good jab and a T jump for that those statements. Oh but, yeah, he was but, kind of oh, ridiculous. Oh, but, but, but I, I actually I actually brought that up uh, outside of the humor aspect in relation to what Neff was talking about of the the categoric denial and. Uh, of basic common sense and i think and i said this before but I, I i strongly think that with the next generation you know i'm 35 pretty much everybody younger than me for sure and everybody coming out of high school right now i mean they're taking programming and coding as part of high school and as more and more of them are understanding it even if it's just on a theoretical level if the direct application 
of what is happening in biology is revealed to them. I think to the, the point we've all been making is the only logical conclusion is that somebody must have designed it unless they are willing to conclude that apps create themselves. I mean, there's no other way around it. Yeah. Yeah, the, I think the uh, the discovery of information linguistics and algorithms in DNA has done more harm and will do more harm in the future uh, to evolution theory than probably any other discovery. Yeah, yeah T-Jump was conflating shared information with complex specified information that's inside the cell. And I, I think you expounded upon that, didn't you, John? Explain that to him. We're not talking about uh, just general... Um, spread out information that's just you know random well I, I did and i mean a huge portion of it too is like the pattern uh repetitive pattern information versus non-random prescriptive and spe uh, specific information i mean it's like it's totally different i mean it's not even uh in terms of outcome oh, oh yeah john but that the, all formed it, on the backs of crystals <laughs> like the, the the complex crystal structures, all of that information formed on the backs of crystals and arranged itself in 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 very specified language that you can read forwards and backwards and all. <laughs> you know, hey, as a sidebar, guys, the uh, uh, NSFT in your debate with uh, Mark Drysdale when he was talking about uh, how horrible the DNA or genetic code is for storing information. I mean, I. I was driving down the road listening and was yelling at the yelling at my car, but the, <laughs> the fact that the genetic code has a quaternary code base, as uh, Jason was saying, can be read forward and backwards, but can have different data expressed based on the direction it's being trans uh, it's being read. I mean, think about that. I mean, when, think if when I'm writing first, it, second, and third dimensions are changed by time over over time by time itself, which absolutely. makes it 4D. Absolutely. And it's also strand hopping. Some information yep. uh, might be on one strand, and the rest of the information on another strand. Well, absolutely. Wow. And beyond and beyond that, they're now discovering subset code bases built into the syntax that actually modify Whoa. the protein synthesis outcomes in a very similar uh, fashion to G-code, not genetic code, but G-code wow. in 3D printing, SLT files types and whatnot. So the, and this is, wow. we're talking about literal three-dimensional time-based mm -hmm. modifications to the core instructions that are being transmitted through the gene sequence. And, and that all being, just happened on the backs of crystals. Yeah. <laughs> So to me, when you think about that in context of the ribosome, the ribosome is like the ultimate 3D printer. So they say. And, <laughs> but how is it being executed? Well, there's additional code outside of, hey, you need this plastic, you need, uh, you know, think about a 3D printer, right? You got like multiple uh, filaments coming. You got metal and plastic and, you know, different pieces. All are controlled by time and pressure and, all, you know, all those different variables the exact same sort of thing is happening yeah. in a ribosome to exactly. result in a protein outcome. And, it's true. Yeah. Uh, ribosomes have been discovered, it's been published in the papers to have uh, to operate based on prescriptive and functional information and operate with algorithms. They have choice contingent qu controls in, built in. Uh, they, can, they can change uh, decide whether or not to change the the, the uh, arrangement of an amino acid while they're inserting it on the fly. Well, uh, oh. and it's just amazing. Oh, sure. oh, Neff, Neff, you know about this? Uh, there's a there's a there's an engine that that while it's joining the there's a machine that while it's joining the proteins together and 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 you know it has to get the right proteins and the right peptides. And it has to join them all together, but it spins them out and joins them at a hundred thousand RPM or something like that. Not, I'm not uh -huh. talking about the flagellum. It, yeah, you know about yeah. that, don't Hel you? Helicase. It's the machinery that duplicates the DNA. One of the strands comes out of this machine, spinning at the speed of the turbine in a jet engine. Whoa! And it's putting them together <laughs> in the it's, perfect it's, order it's, and sequence. It, exactly. It's assembling. It's assembling the base pairs at that speed. Without error, well, with the exception of the rarest, uh, a rare, very rare error, uh, 
It's assembling these things in particular in specific order to match the other the other uh, uh, the DNA molecule a, a, to, and, and, to make the exact copy of it so fast that <laughs> it's coming out of there at the speed of a turbine in a jet engine. A, a, and, and and as we were mentioned, we were talking about earlier on DNA repair. Um, there is actually a component built into the so there's the helicase and then the uh, polymerase. And there's a variety of other factors like proteins that are actually doing the data the transcription, right? Well. There's a, built into those proteins is actually a error read component, and if the matches, oh, that's right, yes. Uh, if if the base pair matches during transcription, both into an mRNA as well as the DNA transcription itself, if there's an error, it catches it, stop. And, yeah, it, and that's right. If it wasn't the, fixing the errors in our body all, all the time, we'd die within hours or days. Well, or something. I think, yeah, well, absolutely, we die. But I, I'm talking about just in the transcription process for a gene to be expressed. Mm -hmm. There's literally an error catch mechanism built in wow. while the transcription is being done on the fly. Right, which is why I say backwards on the molecule, eating away the base pairs. Then another molecular machine attaches and re re reinserts the right ones. Then the polymerase machine goes about its business, continuing yep. to read. It's like it's wow. oh, error, it, it's it's literally like having an edit undo. Uh, spell check, spell check function built in, which is why, to me, when you think about this, and this is why I keep going back to like if you really start to compare this to how did that evolve to technology, they have no answer to it if they actually admit that it is real technology, and right. because nobody with that's logical would actually say, "Hey guys, um, hey, do you remember before? If you're old enough, do you remember before like spell check was in Word?" Yeah. Like there, I vaguely remember those times. I remember that back in the early mid mid nineties. Yeah, right. The, I mean, spell check didn't just pop into existence. You know, it's when you think really think about it and extrapolate out what exists in is a requirement for life. And to your point, Jason, I'm like, yeah, if it didn't, if this didn't happen, we'd be dead in no time. Well, just think about how many errors would not be caught uh, for proteins to be synthesized yeah. if we didn't have that function Whoa. built in. Yeah. Oh, they, never, they, they, they would never, they would never get you snap your fingers. The ribosome would never create the appropriate protein. I mean, Everything it, would be extinct already. We have a super chat yeah. from okay. Dustin yep, yep. Kridzon. He gave a five dollars super chat. He says, "Keep it up," and we appreciate that super chat, Dustin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dustin. Awesome, thank you. And everything you guys are talking about, it all happened by chance for no reason at all, just because. Well, because it did. Evolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it all started off yeah. as a singularity 14 billion years ago, and boom. Oh, and, and it expanded and it expanded billions of times faster than the speed of light, mind you, because for the size of the known universe, <laughs> right. for the right. size of the known universe, which is 13 billion years old, they know it's around about 79 billion light years across, 13 billion light years across, and they know it's actually about 79 billion, and it's still expanding, and they've actually seen something that what they say that might be a structure that they can see on the other side of the universe uh, or, or they can detect something that's that that shouldn't be there on the other side of the 97 billion miles and uh i'm pretty sure you might find that that's where god lives <laughs> um anyways guys we should probably shut her down we've been at this for four hours and it's been a ton of fun um Oh, I loved it. Hey, SFT, can you send me Anthony's email? Because I'd like to get him involved in some of these, too, because he's awesome. Oh, yeah. We, Abiogenesis. Yeah, he's, he's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed having him on the other day. So I'll get you his email. we got to do this more frequently. Uh, we can – obviously, we picked yeah. apart her presentation, her arguments. If anyone has any ideas of other videos that we can just play and debunk through, uh, we'll do it. Evolution Beatdown Night. we got to do more of them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, John and Neff. Thank you so much for turning up and Matt and and I really enjoyed it. Better than a night out at a nightclub when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go to nightclubs anymore. <laughs> Good to hang out with you guys and talk about this stuff. Yeah, it's fun. Thanks for coming on, guys. Everyone had so many good, fascinating points. A lot of intelligent men in here. So thanks so much, guys. God bless. All right, let's go lay down in the bed and do some evolving. Later, everyone. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. <laughs> Okay, mate. All right, Neff.
have a have a good night, mate, and you and, too, uh, and John and everybody. I love you guys, and and uh, God bless you all. Y'all take it easy. Have a good one. See you next time. Well, you God bless. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Praise your scare. You're giving me nightmares. Hey, Jason. <laughs>